Hello and welcome to X Rated, the X Men animated review show. We are your hosts, Devin and Andre. And welcome to the next in our exclusive interview series with special guest, George Buza. Thanks for joining us tonight, George. Oh, thanks for having me. Oh, oh man. Our pleasure. S super excited to have you on the show, George. Big fan. So uh, Definitely. Uh, of, uh, not even just, uh, I feel like all the questions I want to ask him are Little's Tobo questions. So I feel like... <laughs> <laughs> like like uh, of all the the Canadian actors that we've had in the show, you're certainly one of the more prolific uh, that have been in so many, um, you know, uh, projects that we all grew up with, like all through the years. So, well, this and, marks oh, yeah. 53 years in the business for me. Wow! Wow! In fact, this past Christmas, my wife and I just watched uh, the Christmas Horror Story, and I was delighted <laughs> to see. <laughs> I, that movie has the best. That movie is saved by the ending. The ending is the best. It's fantastic, it is, isn't it? Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> It is. I, I don't want to ruin it. Movie. It's it's a ton of fun. I was like, I I my expectations were super low, but I went in with just saying this looks like it might be fun, and uh, I had a blast. It's a super fun movie. It, it wasn't Shatner great. He was. He must have been an easy Anyone. day for him. I'm assuming oh, he yeah. just sat in the booth all day. So he did all that <laughs> in one day. Yeah, it's it's great, especially yeah, when he, yeah, he's and, a master. I don't want to reveal <laughs> too much if anybody hasn't seen it, but it's a great little fun Christmas horror movie uh, that you should check out. Well, yeah. welcome to the show, George. We're so well, happy to have you on. <laughs> I haven't heard Littlest Hobo referred to in a very long time. <laughs> Man, well, uh, it was uh, formative for us. Yeah, well, <laughs> I, I was just scrolling through the TV the other day, a few weeks ago, actually, mm -hmm. and there was the episode with Patrick McNee, mm -hmm. the Jewel Thief one. Yep. All right. Oh, really? Wow, that's hilarious. I, yeah, I get that, like the fact you still be back to the well, the mid seventies. I can't even imagine like I, of all the things that get remade, I can't. I don't know why that one never did. Like I feel like it's the now's the time for the Little Stobo remake. I want to see it. <laughs> I, I want I'd to be see up it. for it. Yeah, hundred percent. You know there you were like a half a dozen dogs. Oh yeah. Oh London really? Was the, Each London one was of them the first. Had a different but... talent. Oh, I just thought it was London every time. No, no, no. <laughs> no. They were they would spray paint the dogs to make them yep. all look the similar. Oh my god. Not yeah, with paint, but like with hair color. Yeah, yeah. 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 Wow. I uh, I do a little bit of acting as well and I was in one of those Beethoven movies, you know the dog and oh, uh, yeah. they, they had the same thing. They had like four four uh, St. Bernards one that all did different <laughs> things. But uh but they had them all painted to look the same. Uh yeah, no that's awesome. Well, 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 why don't you explain how we do things here, Andre? All right. Well, George, generally, I ask you questions about your life and career, uh, and Davin asks you X Men questions. So uh, we or other random or other or other random <laughs> random Davin questions we often call them. Yeah, uh, that's cool. So uh, yeah, just get into it. So uh, where did you grow up? I see that you were born in the states, but you became a Canadian citizen in the nineties. Yeah, I was born in Cleveland. Wow. So what your, did your folks do? Uh, well, my dad worked at Ford Motor Company, and he was a lifer in the Army. My oh, wow. mom was an opera singer. Oh, my God. And oh, wow. a church organist, choir director. She was heavily into music. Oh, wow. So was she Do always... Play? Pardon? Do you play or sing? I played guitar, and I did a lot of musicals in my younger years, but uh, I kind of got away from all that. No, I never uh, felt like not that I didn't enjoy it. It's just that uh, once I started doing TV and film, and uh, I, I wasn't the greatest singer, but I could carry a tune. Hmm. Oh, really? That surprised me with a with your your sort of your deep voice. Uh, I figured you'd. you'd well, it doesn't play. matter. That it mean that you can hit all the notes correctly. Oh, that's true. I have one of those. <laughs> I did the same thing. People are like, "Oh, you must be great at this." I'm like, "Not really." Uh, yeah, I try, but no. <laughs> Nope. I was in glee club when I was in high school, but that was only because I went to an all boys high school and then you'd have co-concerts with an all girls high school. So it was a ah, strategic move. Strategic say, move. Yeah. Your one chance yeah. to meet the girls from the school, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually how I got into acting was, uh, 
I was going with a girl who was uh, a student at the Lourdes Academy, and I went to St. Ignatius, and they were around the corner from each other. And we were dating, and they needed guys to try out for their senior class play, which was Oliver. And I'd never even seen a play before. I mean, I'd gone to my mom's opera performances, but an actual play, I, no. So I got conned into going in and auditioning for the part of Mr. Bumble, and I got it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was contingent, you know. The, your girlfriend tells you you got to go and audition for the senior class play. You go, you go and do it. If you want, you know, happy wife, happy life. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I got this part. And the minute I stepped out on stage on opening night, I was sold. I said, this is what I got to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. This is this is what I'm called to do. Is that the, just the reaction from the crowd? Well, just thing, the, and the feeling, the sensation of uh, being able to entertain people and, and get laughs and uh, mm to do a job well and get applause, you know, that, all that was very, very rewarding. But once you got into the film work, did you go back to theater much? Cause I do theater as well. Uh, I really got out world. of theater. I think the last play I did was 1986. Oh, wow. I, I totally mm -hmm. immersed myself in TV and film and uh, theater is a long-term commitment for mm -hmm. uh, the love of the art really. Yeah. And not for much money. No, so, yeah. <laughs> depending, I guess, on where you where you are, but uh, more often than not. It's, I mean, uh, it's a great basis. I, I would recommend that everybody start in the theater. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you can make a good living at it, then uh, keep it up. But well, uh, I was just so busy with doing television and films that uh, there wasn't the time to go and do anything that was really itching under my skin to, to do. I mean, there yeah. were a few plays that I wish I had a chance to do. I think the biggest draw is the um, instant reaction, right? Like you, you're, oh, yeah. you know, you're you're hitting them instantly instead of like you know going back and watching the movie later in a theater and and knowing if you know the beats hit the way you want them to. So, yeah, there's uh, nothing like getting a good laugh or a round of applause on a line mm -hmm. and having that timing so perfect mm -hmm. that you know <laughs> you knew yeah. you nailed it. Oh man, you're, spe you're speaking my language. That's my favorite part of it too. It's uh, it's, so, it's, it's hard to describe. Anyway, Devin, go ahead. So we definitely thank you for the reverse brain drain. But why did you decide to become a Canadian citizen? Well, because I lived here for so long. And yeah. actually, it would, I was spurred by the fact that I was shooting for two years in South Africa on, on uh, Sinbad? Uh, the adventures of Sinbad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to love it. <laughs> and at that time, too, I, was, I was only a landed ignorant and uh, I didn't have full citizenship. So you could only be out of the country for so long. And so I'd gone to a lawyer and I got a returning resident permit and everything was legal. I was working for a Canadian company and it just happened to be overseas. My intention was always to return to Canada and the border guard, as I came back from the, the filming said, Oh, you're going to have so much fun in immigration. They're going to take you, uh, they're going to send you back home. Because uh -uh. you've been out of the country so long. And I said, no, because I got the papers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Just dancing around the immigration office. That's right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> by send me back, I dare you. In Canada? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I decided to avoid any future hassles. And I, I'd yeah. been here for so long. I, I came here in 74. And this was 95 or 96 mm -hmm. when, when that guy made that comment mm -hmm. and so just did it was it acting, acting that brought you up here? i also wanted to vote yeah uh, oh i really wanted to have a say in uh canadian politics mm -hmm. and after so many years of not having participated in that i decided it was time mm. well, well if well, i could convince you to run for prime minister to here tonight uh i'm pretty sure you can i think you have to be an actual born <laughs> citizen in canada <laughs> Oh, they Although find I... so much about my past. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to open that box. He was a hippie in the 60s. Yeah. Oh, that's cool now. That's yeah, cool. politics isn't yeah, for all of that's us. Super cool that's super cool now. Sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, what uh, I'm assuming it was the acting work that uh, that brought you into Canada. It was. Yeah. I was brought here to do a show uh, for uh, Des Mackinoff. He one of his early plays was a, a children's play called uh, Silent Edward, 
Mm-hmm. And Martin Kinch from Toronto Free Theatre directed it, and Susan Rubish at Young People's Theatre produced it. And they brought me up to play one of the parts and I, on a work permit. And I did the show for six months, and at the end of the thing, I, I was getting ready to go back home, and I got a call and got offered another part, another play. <laughs> so I extended my work permit and did the show, got ready to go back home, got another offer of another play. Wow. And this was too good to be true, you know. I mean, these are all mm. without even auditioning. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, this is this is a good place to be. Yeah. And uh, I decided that I was going to apply for permanent resident status. So I talked to Susan Rubish, and she offered me an entire season of plays at Young People's Theater. Martin Kinch offered me a couple of plays at uh, Toronto Free Theater. So I had two years worth of work, all booked. Wow. And uh, when I went to do my interview, I, I had to leave for four months and go back to Cleveland while I was being processed. And then I had to do an interview in uh, in Detroit at the consulate. And uh, it was a fairly uh, intensive interview. And I'd mentioned in my uh, resume there that I, I spoke some French. And so in the middle of the thing, he switched over into French. And I responded in French. And he picked up, okay, he speaks French. And, and at the end of it, he said, well, as you're coming into Canada, you're going to be uh, self-employed, so you won't be eligible for any benefits, no unemployment insurance. We assume that if you fail, you'll go back home. Welcome to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> that was well, it. We're all self-employed here. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been yeah. self-employed for 53 years. Yeah, well, thankfully, yeah. you're. I'm assuming you're on, the, uh, you're on the benefits package now as a citizen, so... You know, well, health care and all that. Yeah. The important stuff. Mm. And also, I really love Canada. Yeah. You know, I, this is this was everybody hippie's dream back in the 60s. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, I had uh, yeah, I have another yeah. podcast where I talk to uh, folks like yourself and uh, you just want to one interviews. Um, I'm not, not necessarily related to X-Men stuff, but uh, I had uh, uh, an animation director, Bradley Rader, and he grew up in Alaska and he used to talk about in the summer, all the hippies would go there. <laughs> and uh, Alaska was like past all these uh, Anchorage, past all these laws to try to get the hippies out. So they couldn't like, you know, <laughs> camp in the woods or whatever. And his dad was like a, 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 a Freudian, a, judge, wasn't he? a Freudian, a Freudian analyst. Like, uh, and uh, he, he left, he made his property an accessible place for all the hippies to stay. So like, he basically his front lawn was like a hippie commune. <laughs> yeah. going up. Well, back in 1973, my buddy and I, uh, both of us were theater oriented decided we were going to go out west and, and see Colorado and the Rockies. So we drove straight through all the way to Denver. And it's like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And we're in this Pinto, two <laughs> long-haired hippies with Ohio plates. <laughs> you know, we get pulled over. The cop comes up to us and uh, he says, we don't like your kind here. <laughs> oh, wow. Move on. It was like, where are we? You know, yeah, well, Denver, Colorado, just yeah. like the Bob Seeger song. You know, you look <laughs> just like your commie, and you might just be a member. Get out of Denver. <laughs> what happened to us? That's hilarious. Wow. Well, we as said, a former oh, hitchhiking oh, hippie myself, yeah. I can. I well, can relate. They don't Boulder. like our kind. <laughs> they don't like well, our kind. The hippie capital of Colorado back then. Yeah. So he's just like get out of Denver, but go to Boulder. So like yeah. you're fine. You're fine to stay in Colorado, just That's not this right. town. Yeah. Wow. I've had cops pick me up hitchhiking and drive me out of their town just so I'm not their problem anymore. That's really all they want. Well, I've been followed by there. cops on my motorcycle and uh, exited the town. Make sure you don't stop. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Man, what a whole other world. Yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> um so, yeah, well when we had Len- I should ask an X-Men question. Go ahead. Um I think it was Len- Lenore when we had Lenore on. She mentioned that you were the only one of the main cast of the original show that knew anything about the X-Men at the time. Yeah. So how familiar were you with uh, the material going? In? Enough that when I read the dialogue and the characters I knew it was X-Men because they tried yeah. to put it off. They said it, they called it Project X, which is what <laughs> oh. they call everything. Yeah, that uh, they don't want you to know the name of. So I'm reading it, and I go, "This isn't Project X. This is X Men." 
Because I remember when <laughs> X-Men number one came out in 1963, <laughs> I used to read Superman comic books. Mm. And uh, you went to my little five and dime store to pick up the weekly Superman for 12 cents. And right next That's to it, there was this brand new comic, X-Men. So I got that, and I'm looking through it, and it was kind of interesting. But, you know, I, it didn't really pull me away from Superman. Mm -hmm. But it, it, I, I was familiar with it. And I read several other comic books or X-Men comic books after that. But uh, nobody else in the cast was reading comic books. So they didn't know what it was. To them, it was Project X. It, it, in my mind, it was like, well, you're calling it Project X, and it's X-Men. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, funny. You know, it's, it's not like... It's, 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 call it something else. You yeah. know? <laughs> it's, not, it's not the most clever of uh, synonyms, no. you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, what do we call this there, Charlie? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, you X -Men. would have been familiar with the Beast character, too, then, from that yeah. very first issue yeah. of X-Men. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, I see your first credit TV appearance is Kung Fu, the original series. Oh, so, well, actually, uh, that's not true. Oh, no? The uh -oh. very first uh, TV show that I did was Flip Wilson's Salute to Football. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, not familiar with that one. I'm not, but the, the <laughs> that title preceded, of those. <laughs> that preceded Kung Fu. Kung Fu was in the 80s. 75, it says on here, but it might not be. Uh, no, no, it's not in 75. I didn't well, even they... join Actra till 76. Oh, okay. Kung Fu was in the 80s. Ah, okay. Because, well, not only that, but uh, Chris Potter left X-Men to go do Kung Fu. Oh, there was two. Oh, is that why? I was yeah, wondering why he there was The original the Kung Fu the, was done in L.A., and I was not in that. Oh, okay. Must, oh, I was Kung in Fu. The, the Canadian version of it with Chris Potter. Kung Fu: The Legend Continues was the Legend yeah. Continues. Yes, yes. yes. I, that was I another show. That. See, I, as a <laughs> Canadian kid I, in growing up in, uh, we're both in Nova Scotia. Um, that uh, you know, rural Nova Scotia, I had two channels. It was CBC and ATV, and uh, so I, I that's all I watched. That was uh, those <laughs> were the shows. Do South, and uh, you know those shows, and those are all the stuff that. Yeah, uh, I did a couple of Do South. Yeah, I saw. Uh, yeah, I saw that. As well so uh that's great but uh I, we did have a question there Devin from was it murphy that was about quest for fire oh well yeah he's curious to know what your experience was like filming quest for fire because we covered oh. that murphy and i have a mur movie podcast and we covered that <laughs> well that was probably podcast. the hardest movie that i ever did that really? was the most Just from the physically uh from the I mean, makeup we process and everything or? it's naked and afraid yeah. What <laughs> on a film set <laughs> on a film set because yeah. your costume was this animal skin with a, a hole cut in it it went over your head and that was it no where sheep, were you filming no, northern scotland okay uh alberta vancouver island kenya oh wow everywhere wow. oh yeah and then northern ontario I actually heard recently, and I think it was on another podcast, and they're talking about that film. And I think it was like, was it the Inuit people, or uh, they were like, I guess amongst Inuit community, that movie is is uh, almost all of them have a copy of it because the the cast, like, because they hired didn't Inuit cast to speak the language or no. something to no, or maybe they made mix up with another movie. Totally wrong. Okay, but there was a special language that Desmond Morris writ or. Uh... Who wrote the, the the one for Clockwork Orange? Oh, Anthony Burgess. Anthony Burgess. Yeah. He wrote a special language. Oh, just really? for Burgess. Quest for okay. Fire. Must be and Desmond one. Morris <laughs> devised all the movement. He was the movement coach on the show. Oh wow! Oh, that's cool. Hmm. I didn't know. I didn't know Burgess yeah. did the language for that. That's awesome. Oh yeah, that was not Inuit. Now, I must be getting mixed up. There's some other movie where there was. It might have been uh, some other caveman movie, but I can't remember what it was. But uh, fire atra atra <laughs> it's such a good movie and it's so yeah. funny at the end like the buddy just bumbles the fire back into the water like it's the funniest. i ran into ron perlman i hadn't seen oh him yeah since. right that was like one of his first movies too right yeah, yeah yeah and we were doing a comic con i i can't remember where it was and uh, he was across the aisle from my table so i wandered over there and we looked at each other and he goes, Boza. Said, 
you're still at it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> he must be a cool guy to hang out with. He was. Yeah. He's a super knowledgeable guy about movies and stuff, too. Like, I've yeah. heard him on other podcasts talking about movies, and he knows a lot about a lot. Like, he did deep stuff, too. Like, what way back stuff. Um, uh, super cool. All right, Devin, go for it. Did <laughs> well, I wonder what... I was, I was a big Maniac Mansion fan as a kid. Um, that was on uh, uh, YTV, I believe it was on. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I wonder what the casting process was like, or the audition process was like for Turner Edison, because it's just like such a weird part. There's just like, sure, you're this kid who's made into an adult, but you still have the kid's voice, which is like such a strange way to, oh, to the play audition, it. The audition process was... Uh, you know, two or three callbacks. They would say, you know, use a high voice and you pretend that you're four years old. <laughs> and I had a vision. I had a friend, a, a biker buddy of mine that I used to ride with, had a, a young son that was Turner's age. And so I modeled the whole character on uh, Matthew. Oh, Matthew wow. Lally. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, character was a lot of his movements, and they also sent me to uh, a day camp. Oh, really? Yes. Um, uh, speaking of Maniac Mansion, too, because you were also on Red Green, right? Yeah, um, I was <laughs> Many, wondering yeah, when, the, when, the, when the cameras turn off, what's the funniest set to be on, Maniac Mansion or Red Green? Maniac, you know, Mansion. Maniac Mansion, yeah, because all the SCTV guys running around. Oh, yeah, stuff. yeah, and yeah. also. When you get somebody who's like just turning 40 to be a four-year-old kid and regress <laughs> into juvenile behavior, I palled around a lot with uh, the young boy, Avi, and we go up into the, the rafters of the studio because they had, <laughs> for some reason, the, the set decorators put out this bowl of mung beans. <laughs> and right next to the table where there was all these straws, well, uh -oh. Oh, I of course. could not resist, you know. <laughs> Pocket full of mummy up into the the, the lighting <laughs> grid and a pea shooter, you know, boom, <laughs> <laughs> popping all the, the crew. <laughs> wow. <laughs> with mung beans. That's it's, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me laugh. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I love that the character just sort of tra translated into real life, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Real case life. Uh, well, we spoke <laughs> earlier about uh, Sinbad. I mean, that was a big show for you. You're on it for, what, 44 episodes. Uh, a couple years there. So uh, Sinbad's was... brother. Yeah. yeah. Two years in Cape Town, South Africa. That must have been mm. really cool. Oh, uh, it was just amazing. Just amazing. And as a motorcycle enthusiast, uh, I bought a bike while I was down there mm -hmm. and fulfilled mm -hmm. one of my bucket list dreams of riding through Africa. Oh, wow, when we wow. shot Quest for Fire in Kenya, I was already into bikes heavily. And uh, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fabulous to be able to ride in Africa? And then we finished the movie and that was the last I thought of it until Sinbad came along. And there I was with two years of living there Going, oh, I gotta buy a bike, <laughs> and so I found this uh, uh, old Goldwing in the buy and sell, and uh, fixed it up and uh, rode it for while I was down there, and then sold it at the end of the show. Wow! No, yeah, that must have been oh, it was quite the scenery. To well, not to just the to. scenery, but you know, I rode the Rockies and all across Canada and the states, and you know, you see your wildlife, you see bears, and you see mm -hmm. uh, you know moose. But here I was seeing elephants. I rode in this coastal road and the entire road at this one curve was taken over by an entire colony of baboons. Oh, wow. I was sitting in the middle of the road, blocking traffic. And I had to go around them at like five miles an hour, just like when you're taking your bike test, mm -hmm. going around the cones. Well, I was going around <laughs> baboons. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. I want to get on their <laughs> yeah, bad side. That's they hop on cars. Oh, yeah. I had to hop on my car when I was driving through there, and uh, they don't get off. And they'll rip your uh, windshield wipers off and your 
side mirrors. They'll <laughs> they're they're a vicious, vicious animal. And I'm yeah, like, oh have... my god, that's all I need is for one of these to decide to hop on the back of the bike to go for a putt. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. yeah. Yeah. It's not the windshield wipers are losing them. No, no, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they got fangs that are like two inches long. Oh yeah, they're and they're yeah, yeah. crazy and they're strong. Vicious. They're, they're honorable. crazy. Yeah, yeah, and crazy yeah. strong. Like you there was know, a whole movie are... made about this colony of baboons during a a drought and a famine in Africa where they actually band together and they hunted down this guy, a human. <laughs> oh geez. Yeah, I got to see that movie. <laughs> I can't remember the name of it, but uh, yeah. uh, it sounds like the Ghost in the Darkness, but with a baboon. That's but like, great. but with baboons instead of lions. Yeah, yeah that's that sounds cool. Well, it must have been interesting being in South Africa at that time because like apartheid was only it was just a few years before. Apartheid. Yeah, like that must have been a really interesting. Well, I mean, scary but interesting uh, time to be in there. Well, we got a question from MZ here. Did George audition for any characters besides Beast on X Men, the animated series? And were there any mutants or villains he would have liked to have voiced? Uh, I was quite happy doing Beast, but I think I also read for Wolverine. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it would have been a lot of competition for Wolverine. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of folks. Well, you read for everything. Yeah. If you had a deep voice. They give you a, a choice of two or three roles to read for, and then they pick the ones that uh, they thought you fit. Mm -hmm. Well, Did Beast you... has an irresistible charm. It's uh, every scene well, he's in just that. puts I mean, a smile on your face. Anytime an actor creates a character, you know the basis on which he builds is himself. Mm -hmm. So you find those parts of you that are applicable to the character, and then you build the final character on top of all that. Mm -hmm. And there was just so much for me to identify with in, in Beast. You know, I got bullied in, as a kid in school. You know, I was a fat kid and you know, grew up in the 50s. Uh, there was a lot of hassles in elementary school. And, mm. uh, because I was a big kid, I also learned the lesson that uh, if I fought back, I could do some damage. Mm -hmm. And then because I was bigger well, than... Being I was the one that took the blame, even though I wasn't the one that started it. Well, being so, six foot tall at four years old is, is yeah, tough. Yeah, right. <laughs> weighing weighing yeah. 250 yeah. pounds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, these were but, lessons that I brought with me into, into Beast, that you always tried to find a solution to a, a confrontation that didn't involve violence. But you also knew that if it came to it, yeah, well... It's funny because I think I, I brought this up when we, before when we were talking about the episodes of the show that like the character always seemed like obviously the character is like super intelligent and we, we always kind of make some jokes about the, the constant little quotes. Uh, you know, and I have a question about those in a second, but um, the <laughs> uh, the idea that he always seemed kind of restrained, like he knew what well, he yeah. could do, but he did everything he could to not do it, you know, to not not take it to the physical level. And when it does, you know, it could be scary as well. But like you know, he always tried to de-escalate before it got to that point. Um, Those were the one of the things that really drew me to the character too was that <laughs> that de-escalation. You know, the fact that he was basically at heart a pacifist. Yeah. yeah Did you have sure. a favorite beastism? One of those quotes that he. Uh, uh, <laughs> those well, random quotes. A few. I've, I've written down an entire list of things that I take to cons and oh, let yeah. people choose. <laughs> what to read? Oh, I think it's a big my fan favorite of this one, one is when, they, when we're walking out of some place or another, and the, the lady tells calls me Blue Boy, <laughs> and I tell her my name is Mister McCoy, Madam, not Blue Boy, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's one of my favorite quotes. That's a good one. Yeah. Oh, we we uh, yeah. our little names underneath is the one because there's one where like he's in a big fight with someone and. Uh, uh, I think it was Ruckus from Mr. Sinister's group there, and he says he says this quote, and then he's just like Tennyson at the end, you know, yeah. like, he did the yeah. caps it with the, the title. Yes, yeah, so you always have to give fight. credit. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's one what, of the best things about it. That's yeah, what killed us. Credit. That's what killed us. We laughed a lot about that. It's because like mid fight, like for your life, it's just like this beautiful quote that Tennyson. You know? Well, these are all things that that you attribute to the writers. Yes, of course, because they're the ones that do all the inside jokes and everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there was one quote that was totally made up. It was not uh, a quote from oh, that's a, a good a writer one or anything. They just made one up from a mm -hmm. fictitious writer. Mm -hmm. So they would do all these inside jokes. 
And in one scene where he's coming out of court, he's wearing a, a Howard the Duck T-shirt. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And that was an inside joke because one of their buddies uh, animated Howard the Duck. Oh, wow. So they decided oh. to throw Beast in a Howard the Duck T-shirt just for the, the fun of it. That was a great nod to Marvel history, too. I mean, I'm a Howard the Duck fan. Yeah, and, I remember looking for that quote because we <laughs> tried to find all the quotes and stuff, and I couldn't find that one, that made-up one you were talking about there. It was a good quote. I can't quite uh, think of it, but uh, definitely a good one. This is a good one, too. I am always in haste, but I am never in a hurry. Yes. <laughs> <Right. laughs> well, you um, mentioned we were talking about the picture for um, uh, that we had leading into the episode, about the one with Beast crying, and you said that was like your favorite episode, which is the Beauty of the Beast episode. It got 10 out of a 10 from both of us. We it did. It was episode. a great episode. It's one of the best. Well, it's, the it's, it's, it's something that, uh, as a character actor, you seldom get to play these uh, romantic love lead. roles. You're not yeah. the love interest. You know, you're usually the heavy. And in the case of Beast, you know, he was a scientist. He was always spouting scientific uh, gobbledygook and talking <laughs> in 25-letter words. So that when you mm. got to the point, he, he could actually... Uh, exhibit his emotions and feel things that are uh, beyond just throwing people around and coming up with solutions to scientific problems. Well, it also humanizes him because it like, humanized him too. Yeah. At that point he was sort of funny, but he was also like the, the brain of the team. And like when you see him, you know, have a heartbreak and fall in love, it, it just, it's like the last part of what being human is that you never really get to see them do. So it really, uh, really adds to that level. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you resent, like, not resent, I guess, but, like, did you ever, do you like the term character actor? Because some some character actors I find don't when you bring that up. Well, I mean, since you said it, I, I guess you're... Okay. One of the things that I was taught when I was a very young actor and just getting started is that you really don't deny what you are. Mm -hmm. You don't lie about what you can do. Mm -hmm. And you have to take a very realistic approach as to how people see you. Mm -hmm. You know, and when you're six foot two, I've shrunk in my old age, but I was six two, and you weigh over 250 pounds. What else? He, you know, you're not going to play Romeo. <laughs> I, uh, I, I, yeah. I have the, well, I asked because I like, you know, I'm six two, I'm about 250 pounds, uh, you know, and whenever I get cast and stuff, it's always the biker, you know, well, the, yeah, the, I, I made the a same whole sort of things, yeah, playing bikers, and, and it was good. <laughs> Yeah, well, I and it's funny because to me the character like the op the alternative of a character actor is like a movie star, which is like the person that is the same character in everything they do, and that's not interesting to me. The best actors are the character actors. Oh yeah, because they get to play all these different like strange, weird, cool characters that like. And I don't you know, know why you would take offense at it because the term means you're playing characters. Yeah, I think some people don't like the idea that it. Well, they it, don't like being pigeonholed. Exactly. There's so yeah. much. So much idiocy right now and and how language is used and everything like yeah. that and, yeah i can agree with you then but uh, no it's i uh, to me the character actors are the best ones all my favorites are like willem dafoe or paul giamatti or yourself they're all character actors and they're like well, fantastic actors like because they get to do everything one of my uh greatest moments was being able to work with one of the greatest character actors ever it was george c scott I was going to, no, you we know, we were just it, talking about that. Yeah. So I didn't want to bring it up. So I wasn't sure. I'd never seen it, but I'm going to watch it like in the next week because it just came. I saw it in your filmography and I was like, holy crap. There's an H. He's in an HBO movie, George C. Scott, where Scott plays a potential Nazi. I'm like, yeah, this looks yeah. amazing. I'm like, I, <laughs> he, I was the of, he was the, the Iron Guard, the Romanian fashion. Oh, that's what it is. Okay. It says that uh, like he was uh, 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 like in the little blurb, it said he was uh, possibly a. Um, Working with the Nazis and uh, well, yeah, the, so. the the Iron Guard made the Gestapo look like sandbox. No, oh, yeah, yeah, literally, yeah. they were they were the worst of the worst. Well, how did that movie come about? It's an HBO movie, right? So, well, they auditioned. They, they were shooting it in Montreal, and I auditioned for it here and got the part. And again, it was because I was a big guy. Yeah, I played a uh, Romanian wrestler who didn't speak <laughs> English. I had to play the entire role speaking Romanian. Oh wow! Oh wow! And, uh, you know, you learned it phonetically. And mm. I had a Romanian coach who helped me do the dialogue. It's the same thing when I did uh, the Mountie. Mm -hmm. uh, my whole thing was I had to speak Russian. Mm. I don't speak Russian. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, what was Scott like? Like, what was he like to, oh, to work with? Well, <laughs> <laughs> he, 
he was at this point in his career it was kind of like like i don't want to speak ill of him because uh, obviously no, he, was, fan he was a crotchety old man yeah you know? and i remember that we were doing this one scene where three of us had to converge at the same moment at the bottom of a staircase and do a little dialogue and uh, we were on about take six or take seven to work out the timing and the director was kind of tweaking and tweaking mm -hmm. and all of a sudden george c scott said all right i'm getting tired of this and then <laughs> immediately okay moving on <laughs> <laughs> well i watched uh i just watched hardcore recently the uh the paul schrader film that he yeah. did and uh, i was like oh my god he's so good in that movie oh he is i've been waiting to watch um what's the horror movie he's in that everybody loves uh the changeling i've never seen it it's i've been saving it for a special occasion mm -hmm. and it hasn't come yet but uh <coughs> he's just such a, a powerhouse actor like must have been amazing to work with it was it was you know this is the thing is it is living in canada i've had a chance to work with so many american stars starting with flip wilson <laughs> that, wow. you know it was even more prolific in the, the number of people that my life interacted with than if I'd been lived in Hollywood. Hmm. Did you find any, there is like more benefits to the smaller pond? Like, is that something? Well, there is that. Hmm. But uh, also, you know, as a peacenik in 1974, you know, I, I was not a draft dodger. I was one hmm. a until the lottery mm -hmm. and they just, they, they didn't get to my number. They stopped like one number before they got to me. Oh, um, wow. So, and they then they left me there as one A for the next year. Jeez, that must they, have been incredibly no, tense. It was, it was tense, yeah. Because mm. nobody liked Nam. No, mm. I read a, I got a book called the a friend gave me for Christmas called The Things They Carried, uh, by Tim O'Brien, which is uh, about he was in in Nam and it's all about like his experience and stuff. And uh, man, it's uh, I'm not normally one for like real life war books or nonfiction books, but. Uh, it's super good, and it really is eye-opening about what that there's, experience there's is a, like. There's a book about the tunnel rats. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. That, I mean, these were guys that crawled into all those labyrinth tunnels. Yeah. Jesus. <laughs> they mentioned that in the book briefly, but... Yeah. Uh, anyone listening want to look up that movie we discussed with George C. Scott? It's called Descending Angel. Uh, well, it, M MZ says the quote that they made up for beast was from weapon X, X lies and videotapes. And he says it to silver Fox. So people can go look that up. <laughs> it's a great, line. Uh, great title too. Like yeah, the I love fans know more about this than, the, than I do. I can remember. Well, I love, Oh yeah. Too. They, I just we've got that, some like, great div listeners here. They're always helping us out. With oh, the yeah. info. And I love that the writers <laughs> like would, you know, the writers were so in on these jokes that they would slip in like X lies and videotape because the, you know, the movie Sex Lies and Video Tape yes. just came out and it was a big deal, the Soderbergh movie. Uh, you go ahead, Dennis. Well, uh, our buddy Murphy here mentions your motorcycles. And um, when we were had Allison and Celie Smith on the show, she, well, actually, she mentioned to me after the fact that you should, uh, we should ask you about your motorcycles. <laughs> well, I, I've been turned into a biker since I was 15 years old. I lived across the street from this guy, uh, Roy Channels, and he was a salesman for uh, a book company, Simon & Schuster. Oh, big one. And, uh, <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. I still have uh, my original first edition of Do It by Jerry Rubin. Oh, wow. Do you still have your X Men number one copy? No, I don't. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, I don't have any. Of my but anyway, ones. back to the motorcycles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Roy's brother was a member of the Galloping Gooses, which That's is one of name. the very original outlaw motorcycle gangs back from the days of Hollister in California, wow. with the booze fighters, and so. He parked his chopper in Roy's garage, and I was gawking at it all the time. <laughs> and one day, Roy bought himself a Honda 260 CB, and that was a more realistic motorcycle than this giant hog that I was looking at all the time parked in his garage. <laughs> and at 15, no driver's license, nothing. Roy just decided, says, here, take her for a spin, and he threw me the keys. Oh, wow. I'd never ridden a bike, you know, except for my bicycle. 
And I drove it all around town wow. uh, in Bay Village, uh, outside of Cleveland, and fell in love with motorcycles. There was didn't a, dent it. <laughs> did, I, I nearly dumped it. Oh, jeez. Uh -oh. oh, yeah. <laughs> That's terrifying. With thumping, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's all I need. I broke Roy's bike. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it went the other way with your love of motorcycles. Might never rode one again. <laughs> oh, I, I I just gave it up a couple of years ago because the arthritis oh. got to me. And I tried to pull it out one year and I couldn't get my leg over the thing. No, oh, uh, that's sad. It's time to give it up. And actually, that photograph that you had of Beast, the, the tears. Yeah. Yeah. When I put the bike up, that's the the caption that I put up. <laughs> uh, beast, uh, beast from X Men must sell his bike. Oh no! <laughs> well, but I hope it got some good day. offers. Yeah, good. <laughs> you to get more questions. Did you ever that. think you'd voice that character again? No, it's just been such a long. The revival time. of anything is so rare. Yeah. I mean, we talked about it when uh, Julia and Eric wrote the book uh, previously on X Men. <laughs> yes, you're showing oh, I, the previous I have, on X Men. I have one yeah, right here. The one. Yeah. The uh, this conversation went around to well, wouldn't it be great if we could revive the series? Because they they were the ones that actually told us how popular the series was. Mm. We were never told while we were making the show that you know. There were barrels of mail piling up in the studios in L.A. Oh, really? Wow. From fans. Is that and, financial reasons they didn't want you to well, know that? <laughs> they tell actors, you know. Yeah. yeah. They, oh, what are they going to do? They're going to more money. money. Yeah, that's what they're yeah. going to do. So you just keep them in the dark and go, well, I don't know if we're going to renew this or not. You know, well, oh, please, please just let me renew it one more year. Yeah. <laughs> That's all yeah. we were worried about. You know, hey, we got a job. So we never knew how popular the series was. And then when Marvel was sold to Disney and uh, it became number one, the old series, number one on Disney Plus. Yeah. We started talking more seriously about you know. Oh, it became number one on Disney Plus. Oh, yeah, I didn't instantly. Realize that. Instantly. Oh well, well, I watched it instantly when I got Disney Plus, so I guess I was one of them. But yeah, yeah, yeah. and it stayed yeah. at number one. You know, oh, a twenty-five-year-old wow. show. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that spurred a lot of the uh, the interest in reviving the series, but we had yeah. to re-audition for all our parts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, they wanted to see, you know, does he still sound like him? You know, because people age and you know things change. Yeah. Yeah. And I, they obviously been a couple uh, different ways with some characters. So, well, so. some people were, you know, too old already, and other people passed away. You know, we've yeah. lost a number of cast members. Yeah. Yeah. Norm and David, anyway, right? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, it occurs to me, I don't know if you realize or you're aware of this, but in the most recent Captain Marvel movie, there's a Beast cameo at the end of the movie. Uh, now, so Beast now is an entirely CGI character in the MCU. So which I mean he's voiced by Kelsey Grammer in that in that uh post credit scene. But being a completely CGI character made me think it Perhaps you should have voiced Beast in the MCU. I would prefer it. Should going forward, yeah, yeah, right. Me too. Well, that's not up to me. Yeah, I know, but it's just it was a lost opportunity. I well, felt. and there's still time. There's still time because you know the the X Men's coming in the MCU. So, was your involvement in the X Men movie, uh, the the original film, uh, like just as a fun nod to the to the your well, role in the? I actually went in there legitimately auditioning for the part of the trucker. Mm. because when the any American movie comes up to Canada to film, all the lead roles are cast by the American stars, and then all the incidental characters are cast locally. Mm -hmm. So the, my agent set me in to read for the part of the trucker number, whatever it was, and uh, didn't even have a name. We had about five, six lines, but he had a scene with Anna Paquin and a scene with uh, Hugh Jackman, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. little as they may be. So I went in there and I read my five, six lines and I knew the guy who was the stunt coordinator and he was sitting next to Brian Singer and he leaned over to him and he says, 
that's the guy that does the voice of Beast. And Brian, Brian Singer lit up and he called me over and he says, uh, if it weren't for your series, I wouldn't be making this movie today. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, he's in that age group where he was. Yeah. You know, that was so many people's introduction to the X-Men. And... Yeah. And also like the, you mentioned the roles, you know, as a kid that, you know, you used to, to kind of craft beast as you, as you have, uh, were sort of based around, you know, feeling, being bullied and not feeling like you belong and being treated like a, someone less, lesser than, and, and kids like him, cause you know, he's gay and other people yeah. I'm sure felt that way growing up. So that show well, elementary was... school was, a, was a horrible. I hate oh, it. Yeah. Mine too. <laughs> no, I was bullied so badly. I mean, it didn't, I was the son of uh, Eastern European refugees born after World War II, so I, I got a lot of, my dad fought your dad in the war. I said, well, no, he uh, didn't, because my dad was too young to be in the war. He was a refugee. <laughs> he was not, not. a he, he was 16, and he fled. Yeah, that's what refugee yeah. means. That's what refugee means. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and they'd all want to fight me, and, and I, it didn't help being fat mm. and it didn't help being dressed like a nerd because being the, the child of Europeans you didn't wear blue jeans those were farmer clothes you were sent to school in dress pants dress shoes and a dress shirt well, uh... and that was not cool <laughs> no no definitely not it was, it, was, it was like painting nerd dork <laughs> in giant letters <laughs> was it the thing in Cleveland yeah, yeah, in Cleveland, too. Oh, and no. that was where I, I realized that, you know, as I was being bullied, I decided one day that I was just going to haul off and let fly. And mm. I did. And a guy lost his tooth. <laughs> and I was the one that was to blame. All of a sudden, I was the assaulter. Yeah. All I was doing was defending mm -hmm. myself because what they did back then was they would form this big ring around you. And then the one guy that wanted to go in and prove himself would step into the ring and you had no choice. Mm -hmm. You fought mm -hmm. or you got pounded. Well, yeah. some things never change, do they? No. <laughs> uh. No, and it's also the you know when you're the big kid in the school, in the class too, people think that it makes them look tougher by beating you up. You well, know? it's like being the bouncer in a bar. Yeah, you know everybody. The li it's the little guys that always come up to you and they want to do you. Yeah, because hey, I got that big guy and I took him down. You know. Well, oh, yeah, I bounced yeah. a lot in bars because I, as a as an actor, you didn't work. You know, seven days a week, fifty two weeks a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you came to the end of a theater gig and you had enough money to make it till next week, and <laughs> you had to go and find a job. Yeah. So, well, speaking of which, another thing, Allison said we should ask you about <laughs> your career as a bodyguard <laughs> yeah i uh i worked for larry flint for a short period of time oh wow wow <laughs> how was You're that larry yeah, flint's bodyguard uh, i used Whoa. to work again in cleveland as a bouncer i was working in this uh place called the agora and it sat two thousand people and it was a uh, a big bar, uh, a rock and roll venue. Bruce Springsteen played played there right after he released Born to Run. Wow. Mm. And I got to see all these great bands that came through there. But I was just a bouncer. And there was a security company there, Beach Security. And they were also hired to keep the peace because on Wednesday nights, all beer was a dime and shots were a quarter. Jesus, oh, in a venue that sat two thousand people. There's no so way you can that imagine the zoo, problems. the <laughs> zoo that would entail fights galore. You know, you could. Anyway, they said, you know, you're doing the same thing that we're doing, except we're getting paid a lot more, and we carry guns. <laughs> 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 so. I said, yeah, well, that, that sounds reasonable to me. Who do I talk to? Sign me up. So they introduced <laughs> me to the guy that ran the security company, and he hired me, and I went and did a course in uh, you know, self-defense and uh, law, firearms. The next thing you know, uh, I'm working in uh, Captain Frank's restaurant, 
which was, again, the, the guy who owned it, his name was Frank Visconti. <laughs> <laughs> and on Tuesday nights, people would come in and give him giant wads of money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> and I had to walk him to his car and make sure that uh, everything was basically looking after Captain Frank. Mm -hmm. Never asked, you know, what he used to do, but I had a good idea. Yeah, you, <laughs> you, you probably keep jobs like that by not asking questions like that's that. right. Yeah, and, exactly. So, and then one day Larry Flint came in, and uh, was this before he liked after the fact that shot. I was this big guy? And uh, he said, to Talk to your uh, your manager, you, I want to hire you as uh, in my club. Yeah. So, I called the the guy who ran the security business, I said, I think I just got us a new contract to, to hustle for <laughs> Cleveland. And he says, okay, I'll give you 10%. <laughs> wow. wow. And you get to work there. Wow. Nice. And so that was, uh, I did that for a while. This is what sent me to Colorado is after working there for, I don't know, six, seven months, you know, it was like, holy mackerel, you know, where am I? I, I wanted to be an actor and here I am. <laughs> working nights with all this like really dangerous people yeah was this and before this isn't this... acting this is all real you know the, the gun i'm carrying is real and, uh, uh, was oh, he in the chair when he hired you or is that before that no happened? no this is he just Light came down from the hills of southern ohio okay this was 1973 i feel like working in like a place like hustler i know you're security but i mean you're around all of that uh must have been like I feel. I feel like people glamorize industries like that one, but I imagine the day to day must be incredibly boring. The same as anything else after a while. Oh, no, 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 <laughs> not at all. Okay, there was. There's nothing, there's nothing boring about working in a strip club. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. So. <laughs> I worked in in one when I came to Canada too. Between yeah. gigs, I used to work at the Brass Rail and uh, at the Zanzibar. Oh, Zanzibar is a classic one that I've heard. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a legendary one. <laughs> I think well, uh, brass whale too. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, no, yeah, no, we don't need to talk about our experiences there. That's no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I see you worked on. Uh, I think it was Romero's last movie. It was a Diary of the Dead. That was close to his last movie. Yeah, right? yeah. What was he like to work with? Well, I only had that tiny little cameo. It was one day yeah. and. He came up and he says, oh, he says, one day we got to do something together. He says, you, we got to do something together. And then he died. Yeah. Oh, mm. no. Uh, well, other question, too, about directors. I know you did an episode of Fear Itself, uh, an episode written by Max Landis and directed by Ernest Dickerson, who's kind of a guy that I'm a huge fan of. So uh, what was what was that one like as well? Well, that was, that was a lot of fun. I mean, it was kind of yeah. weird because my wife had just passed away a little bit before that. Mm. So I was kind of in a in a strange space, but uh, it was a wonderful cast, and uh, the producer of the show was also the guy that produced Honey I Shrunk the Kids and Sinbad. So they oh, brought really? me in for an episode. That was Jonathan Hackett. Hmm. Yeah, because they moved the Honey I Shrunk the Kids TV show. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, with uh, Scalari. Peter Scalari. Right? Yeah. yeah, he might, he seemed like a cool guy too. He was the nicest man that I ever worked with in my life. Really. Oh, yeah. I had so much fun on that show. He was the most generous actor. And, you know, we had a really good rapport comedically, too. Mm -hmm. it was, it, that was the most fun I ever had. Well, As a matter of fact, fun. I just got uh, some new pictures printed up that uh, mm. I'm going to take to Comic-Con. Oh, nice. Oh, oh uh, very good. The scene where we're dressed up as stormtroopers. Oh, yeah. There we that's go. Awesome. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's another guy that's kind of permeated culture, you know, in a way that, like, you've definitely seen a million things he's been in, but you may not, you know, focus on him specifically, like Bosom Buddies and like, yeah. that. Uh, New Heart was a big show when I was growing up. Yes. I used to watch I always watch New Heart. Yeah, me too. You're so good in that, too. Yeah, me too. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. It's a cool, very cool actor. Wait, Devin, you go ahead. Well, you know, when you went dark there for a second, Andre, George mm -hmm. told us that uh, X-Men TAS was the number one show on Disney Plus when it first launched there for quite a while. Oh, that, that, that incredible. Yeah, sorry, I didn't run to the washroom. Uh, you know, that that's, does not surprise me in the least. Uh, that's, that uh, I think it was one of the first things I uh, 
Yeah, and the X Men ninety seven trailer is up to eight point five million views. So. Yeah, so and it's so that's breaking records too. The X Men ninety seven trailer. I don't know. I mean, I assume. Well, I assume the landscape must be so much different for you now working for like Disney than it was back when you're just like a bunch of scrappy young actors working for you know Saban, S- Saban. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> well, the, I, out of red tape and things you can't talk about. Must honey, be. I shrunk the kids. I was working for Disney. Oh right, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I guess I did a miniseries uh, about the uh, the pioneer days for Disney too. But the, I guess the level of how much they how important keeping things quieter now than they probably used to be back in the well we never signed ndas oh well back yeah but for back then you just never well there was no there was no uh internet Internet. yeah Yeah. who who would find out who'd you tell like one guy what's who's who's he told one guy and he forgot it (laughs) he's not gonna run up the street and start yelling you know hey i guess what i learned about this show (laughs) and it wasn't that nothing went viral nothing was that big you know that I remember, you know, people would be waiting for the new Star Wars installment or something like that. That nobody ever leaked stuff. Yeah. Although, Battlestar Galactica beat them to the release by one week, and there was a huge kerfuffle over that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Huh. Crazy. What What was the kerfuffle? Just the, well, that, they that, they, that that was happening. Stole the idea not necessarily stole the idea but they came up with a similar idea and they made a movie and then they rushed it so that they would beat star wars mm-hmm. to their uh oh their yes release. yes i am familiar with this that is true yes mm. yeah yeah sneaky that's uh no sneaky. Well, speaking of kerfuffles well i don't even know if i should get into this because this is an x-men interview but i also did a tv series go, called mutant x it. Oh yes, yeah, right. I remember that. Yes, I, I, yes. I, I was going to ask you about that, but it was a Fox thing, right? That was kind yeah. of a, a rip off of a Marvel thing. Well, but there was it, actually a lawsuit, and uh, yeah. they oh, decided that the mm. Mutant X was different enough that the, there wasn't any copyright infringement. Yeah, yeah their Professor X wasn't in a wheelchair. That was about wow. the difference. <laughs> 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 Well, like because John Shea, Shea was on that show too, right? He was like Lex Luthor on on Superman and Lois. Yeah, uh, he was, was the it John Professor Shea? X guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was one of those shows that uh, is like there's quite a few because like some of the actors from that you'd see pop up in a bunch of other stuff that would appear. Like there's a show called Cleopatra twenty five twenty five that had one of the main actresses on it. I used to watch, and a few others, but uh, yeah, like that that was must have been interesting, or even just going through the Canadian television system you know going bouncing through all these shows and doing all this sort well, of stuff. again that was the same producer yeah. that was jonathan hackett again bringing <laughs> me on board you know he, he must have been like a guy that had his fingers in almost all the shows because <laughs> there's quite a few of them yeah yeah oh he was also uh he started off on night heat as a driver oh, oh wow interesting yeah hey Devin, you got some excellent questions well, you you did mention uh, kind of bringing things to the role of Beast. Um, is was the Shakespearean qualities that he has something that you brought, or was that like direction? No, he's that very was Shakespearean. I mean, mm. the the enunciation and the way Beast spoke mm. was theatrical. Mm-hmm. In that very much sense. so. It makes but, a lot of sense that you did theater. Now that I know that, because uh, I also I know. did a season at, uh, at Stratford. Mm-hmm. Until oh, wow. John Hirsch told me, "Well, you you don't really belong here." <laughs> oh, it's <laughs> a good way to find out. Yeah, what was that about? Well, I knew that. I, oh, you know, by that time I was already so focused on doing TV. I just finished Quest for Fire, and oh. uh, I knew that I wanted to do more and more film. And my agent said, "Here's an opportunity for you to do Stratford." I would take it, mm-hmm. and uh, I did, and I enjoyed myself. But it's a very long season, and it kind of takes away the possibility of you doing uh, doing anything else. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And by our, that time, friend... I was already on the way out of wanting to do a lot of theater. So I did my one season, and I knew I didn't want to go back. Well, so Shakespeare's I mean, a special kind of experience. You have to really, really want to do it. 
you know, yes. to, uh, I've done memorization just, I, alone. <laughs> it's like anything I find, like it's not too, once you get the hang of it, it's not bad, but it's like, I don't know. I've only skirted. I've never done a full Shakespeare play. I've only been in like plays that sort of were like plays within plays and did Shakespeare in that way. But uh, even just the the way I skirted it, I was like, I, I don't. I would like to try a full one, but I don't know if it's for me either. I feel like it's. Well, I did. Uh, I played Falstaff in Merry Wives. Oh, that's a good one. And uh, then when I was at Stratford, I only did the one play. It was uh, Wild Oats. Mm. And it mm. wasn't a Shakespeare play. No, it was a okay. Temporary of his. Yeah. Hmm. Awesome. Interesting. Well, our friend Jamil would be upset if I didn't mention Meatballs 3. <laughs> uh, again, <laughs> this is one of those movies where you, you go, and they paid me for this? <laughs> <laughs> it was like a, a two-month-long party. <laughs> and that scene the scene where we're in the bar and i've got three beers and i'm drinking three beers at the same time yeah and ronnie hawkins is playing and then we're having the wet t-shirt contest those were real beers <laughs> and, and just in shooting that one scene i drank 18 beers oh wow you know? <laughs> what take did they keep i don't know <laughs> no. i hope that was the last scene of the day no. <laughs> well, I guess like, they would be used to that on that set. Well, that was that was the nonstop party. <laughs> oh man, well, it's, 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 like can't wait for X Men '97. A lot of people are very excited. Very well, excited. they've only got a week to wait. It's my birthday. It's it comes out on my birthday. Oh, happy belated birthday oh, to you! Thank you. Way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, March 20th is when it's going to air. Yeah. And March the 13th is when they're having the uh little screening in LA. Oh. Oh, awesome. are you going down for that? No, no. No. We have to do Comic-Con on the 15th. I was going to uh, ask you how much how that that's been cuz like is it only recent that you guys have been doing it as like all of you going together or Yeah, well that, that... it started when Jarek and Julia published their book. Mhm. Mm uh, they had an agent, uh, Mike Perez, who was uh, looking for people to take to Comic-Cons, and he was their agent. And they decided to get together a number of the uh, cast members and go to uh, New Braunfels, Texas, for our first X-Men reunion. Hmm. And it was a pretty small show. And, but we all had such great fun. And meeting the cast, the, the fans. It was the first time we ever came face-to-face -face with people who were fans of the show. And this was what really enlightened us to the fact that we really made a difference in a lot of people's lives. It and we had huge. no idea at the time that we were doing it that you know we were doing anything more than just making a Saturday morning cartoon, an action cartoon. We had no idea that there was actual... You know, emotional investment by our fans because none well, of that was shared. It was and kind we of a double the... whammy effect because not only was it one of the first times the comic books were really kind of brought to life in an accurate way that the fans really appreciated, but it also the fact that it was the X Men and it spoke to people about you know being on the an outsider yeah. in those issues as well. So it was this double whammy effect that I think helps it sustain so long yeah yeah so sure. it, it, it was so much fun and it was that was the first time that we got together and started doing the shows and then after that we did about three more shows that year and then we got another agent uh byron burton who uh started booking us into larger shows and then we started doing uh we did shows in uh, los angeles and new orleans portland Nashville, not Nashville, but uh, Chattanooga. And Did you go we, down to that X Men specific one? It was like the uncanny experience. Uh, I'm doing about. that in September. I was busy yeah. that weekend when, hmm. and that they called me a week before the show. Originally, oh, it was only going to be Cal and Laura and Lenore that went, hmm. and then all of a sudden they decided to act, ask uh, some other cast members. And then, like five days before the show, they sent me an email. Said, "Hey, how would you like to come?" I said, "Well, I've already got plans that weekend. I can't just 
mm. up and fly to Minnesota. So I'm doing it this year. Awesome. In September. If you get what's your do you have an interesting con story, maybe from all these conventions? Because you know, you're meeting all well, these. Well, the fans one that sticks into my mind is, is the one where the, the guy came to my table and uh, he was actually moved to tears. And he had to go outside and compose himself before he could come back and have a conversation. Was it this guy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, That's the full beast it was just like, somebody yeah. who was so emotionally in, in invested in the show and in what the show meant to him that when it became a reality, it was much like when I came face to face with George C. Scott. You know, you're kind of <laughs> yeah. And, well, it, and again, in uh, Maniac Mansion, we had Jose Ferrer as a guest, and we dressed him up in a goat suit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that show is ahead of its time. Ferrer, this is like you know, one of the the icons of, of acting. I have to go. I, the, I missed Maniac Mansion. It was I was is my my uh, because I only had the two channels. I never had YTV, so I never got it. I never. Oh, that was so there. tongue in cheek. Oh, I, because yeah, our yeah, so our good. carrier was the family channel, which was right. Pat Robertson's channel down in the Virginia Beach. Mm -hmm. And so the writers were constantly trying to sneak in things. Like, we couldn't have a bottle of wine on the table during dinner. Oh, wow. <laughs> so there were, there were all these little innuendos and jokes that, of course, SCTV writers are trying to slip it all past the, uh, the family channel and make the show... You know, a little riskier than uh, what That's they fun. were anticipating, without ringing the bell. <laughs> well, I think they uh, achieved that pretty well. Like, yeah, when, uh, they did. Harry, Harry the fly has an affair yeah. with an actual fly, and like, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of crazy stuff. Even the first episode was called the 10th anniversary special. Like, even yeah. that's wacky. Everything about <laughs> that's, that show—that's pretty like, great, actually. Yeah, that. that's pretty great. That's and then really the final nice. episode was the rap party. Right. And everybody that was involved in the show at any time was invited to the final episode. And George Lucas showed up with oh, the original wow. lightsabers from Star Wars that we got to play with. Oh man, oh, that's wow. so cool! Like it's oh. when you go through the credits of that show, it's like every like Eugene Levy will write an episode, and then you yeah. have one written by Martin Short, or like it's they really went out and got the. Well, we had SC the entire TV cast of the SCTV on at one point or another. Yeah. Was John right. Candy ever on? Well, no, he's already gone by then. Yeah, I was going to say he oh, died was, by was he by then? Okay. Yeah. Joe Flaherty must have been fun to hang out with. I, I was on. Yeah, a, he was. I did background on a show one time that he did in Nova Scotia called Call Me Fitz, and uh, he was mm. he was a hoot. He was just like, yeah. like he's never off. Just like when you like the cameras aren't on him, he's always on, just entertaining everybody around him. It's a hoot. Well, yeah. uh, the fact that you, like you talked about the how much that Beast touched that particular fan and stuff. It, I mean, I always kind of felt like Beast was the heart of the show, like of the team anyway, and definitely the heart of the show. Um, I had read somewhere that he had that they had not intended for the character to be around as long no. as he was. Yeah, he was never going to be a member of the the permanent cast. It was just a passing character. And uh, so it was the plan to keep him in prison. They were to keep him in prison all the time. Yeah. Yeah, so it was just like the way your character in your performance of it connected with the I fans. Guess they they connected with the fans, and they decided it's an irresistible charm. That keep, character keep is amazing. Um, it, it's, it's the the quotes are so funny, but uh, you know that I I can relate to that fan who came up to you. I have been brought to tears by this cartoon more than once, and Beauty and the Beast is definitely one of those yeah. times. Oh yeah. Like, that was it was a, surprising that episode because we were just kind of jammed in between these big two and three parters, and we're just like, Oh, it's gonna be like a fun beast episode, and then we're just like blown away by it. And ten, we don't do double 10 out of 10s very often, yeah. and you know, shows. everybody on that show knew each other from before because the voiceover community in, in Toronto is, is pretty tightly knit, mm -hmm. and even back then, mm -hmm. th there was a core group of people that you all knew. And Kara Lee, who played Carly, uh, I'd known her for years. Matter of fact, I used to be a rock hound in my sprier days, and my neighbor and I would go up to Bancroft, which is the mineral capital of Canada, hmm. and go into the old 100-year-old mines and look for mineral specimens. 
and we found this place that uh, uh, used to be a, uh, a fluorite mine, and uh, it turned into a uranium mine when they discovered it, and it's up in Wilberforce. And uh, I guess uh, Kara Lee and her daughter were getting into collecting minerals, and they went up, and I gave them the directions on how to get there, and they explored this mine, and they were taken by it, <laughs> as was I, because there's this deep uh, shaft that you can go into and add it that has a fork in the middle, and then the, the layers, there's this purple layer of purple fluorite, bright plur purple. It's about two, three feet wide, sandwiched between bright white crystalline limestone. Wow. So it's quite spectacular. Wow, that sounds mm. amazing. Yeah. Huh. And it's Shunk radioactive. It? <laughs> oh, that's Don't fun. get too close. Keep your distance. That's where you get the blue fur. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Low in the dark. Well, was yeah, uh, MJ makes the point that the Leewalds did say Beast was their favorite to write for. That's true. They said that on this show. Um, was it fine to hear the voice, or was it? I guess because uh, uh, throughout the years you had revisited the voice for for a few video games and stuff. Mm. So was it? Was no, it's was not it, hard. I mean, it's basically you know? my voice. Yeah, <laughs> you know, you talk true. normally, and uh, mm. all you do is enunciate a little bit more. And yeah, it's a bit it. of a lilt. It's a bit of a lilt to it. He's like, yeah, it's, it's a little, a little bit of a lilt. Yeah, yeah. But it's and then say Tennyson, and then you've got it. <laughs> 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 All right, Dan, um, what we got. Well, that's a good question from MZ here. Um, he asked if you recorded solo for X Men '97, or if you did it with the cast, like we've been told you guys did early on in the X Men TAS. You did like cast that was reading. only the first season that we recorded as a as a group. Well, MZ asks if there's any interesting stories from when you guys would do the cast reads together. Well, yeah, there was the Norm Spencer was always a jokester. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is one of the stories that Cal and uh, Chris Potter always tell at the cons on the panels <laughs> that uh, if Chris Potter did this take uh, of reading Gambit and Norm just Turned to him and goes, Is that the way you're going to do it? <laughs> you know, instilling complete paranoia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's let's make him doubt his yeah. ability. Especially to do on it. such a risque. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not voice anymore. Like I'm not. That. Yeah. No. Yeah. What, 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 was, what was wrong with it? Yeah. Uh, it's awesome. it's pretty great. <laughs> but we, you know, there in those days, you know, there was a lot of joking around and. Uh, we didn't really do a lot of ad living and stuff. I mean, it was a tight schedule. And mm -hmm. in the in the booth itself, you know, all the producers were there and the director was there. It's not like now where everybody was on a screen and you go in and it's you, a microphone, mm -hmm. and the engineer, and uh, a TV screen with just like this, you know, mm -hmm. with the director and the producers all in little squares and various. <laughs> I mean, then everything was sent down to Los Angeles on cassette tape. We do the recording in Toronto, and they courier it down in on cassettes. Well, I guess you'd have to do a lot less traveling now for voice acting, because I think like, yeah, Lenore well, so many hers, people have done uh, studios in their homes. Yeah. yeah, I know Lenore did hers at the the Trailer Park Voice Studio in Halifax. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't bother with that. I bought a microphone. Oh wow! So you That's just did it right from your house? Yeah, I'm in my office. That's you can see crazy. the coat hangers on the door behind me. Yeah, <laughs> my That's head, this is my little per voice cabinet of uh, beast memorabilia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Beast oh very cool. That's there beautiful. they are, and all the the toys that people have gotten me over the years, and never have too many toys. No, well, <laughs> not at all. Well, There's no more cool. room for them now. Well, oh, well, well this yeah. is the, have... the only little space that I have left now. And my um, Stepdaughter and her family live with us now, so there's seven of them. Oh wow! Oh, and wow. two dogs. <laughs> oh shoot! You get a full so house. This is a, this is a, a of maniac house. mansion. It is maniac mansion. <laughs> <laughs> the youngest one is three, and the uh, the oldest granddaughter is twenty one. Wow! So they all live here. Then the two dogs, and we love them all, and they're the best thing that ever happened. Do you spray paint one dog to look like the other dog? No. <laughs> they actually they, they look identical. They have oh, the same oh, wow. markings. 
except one is an English bulldog that weighs about 60 pounds, and the other one is a chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> they have the, the identical same markings. Oh wow! Now there's your little list hobo re there's remake your little there. Bozo. Yes. Yeah, 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 but yeah, it's, it could be more than one dog. The little hobos fly it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah fly it up the chain so you would see you see things. I'm sure they can bring <laughs> it back. Bozos. That was the first celebrity that I ever met as a kid. Bozo the clown. Bozo the clown. Oh wow! wow. Mine was Mister Dress Up, I think. <laughs> another, another Canadian icon. I think mine was Fred Penner. It's probably someone like that. So uh, another Canadian icon. Uh, no, this, awesome. this was in Cleveland. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, Bozo was very famously an American club. Uh, yeah, that's funny. So, I don't uh, think we have an equivalent. Well, you know, <laughs> kids, kids style, entertainers right? to the extent. Yeah. Uh, well, I know you can't tell us anything about the ex the upcoming show, so uh, we, I won't bother trying. Um, but Dad, well, it's only know. days away, so there's nothing really to tell. That is true. Cool. But, but, but the internet is up where we left off in '96 when we that's stopped amazing. recording. Mm -hmm. And uh, they've stayed true to the characters. Are you? Were you allowed? Like, does the cast get to see the episodes in advance? Or no, do you we saw them? little snippets of it when we did the uh, ADR. Okay. Uh, the animation looks spectacular. Yeah. Course, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Technology is twenty-five years further than mm -hmm. it was before, and so, and also they were looking for the cheapest animators back then. Mm -hmm. Saban was not exactly known for their <laughs> open, no. deep pockets. <laughs> we've no, we've I, gotten a few Saban stories. Hey, we had to, to buy our own show our jackets. jackets. Oh, my God, really? You had to yeah. your own jackets at the show? Oh, my yeah. God. You still have it? Yes, I do. Oh, it's, that's awesome. It doesn't fit anymore because it's a triple <laughs> extra large, and I'm now down to a size XL. Well, that's Is that uh, the one Cal still wears? I think Cal oh, yes, still wears he his. Still wears his. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love like Saban. It kills me that like that, like everything about them is like just like scraping pennies. Like you know, the biggest show they have was like Power Rangers, which is mostly just reusing and like put oh, a cash Japanese TV show and recording <laughs> interstitial scenes. You know, it's just so funny. Well, they were animating us in the Philippines. Yeah. Right. Mm. Well, uh, two very, very distinctly different studios. We've, yeah. we've come to realize. Oh yeah, yeah. There's a stark change once it hits the other studio. Um, yeah. But no, it looks beautiful. The trailer's amazing. I mean, I know the internet's exploding with people being, you know, waiting for any. I just hope it. that it's it's successful because we, uh, we've hyped it so much. It, it so have we. So I like our reputations the, are on the line. I, I hope people are not disappointed. <laughs> it, I know that when be, I was reading the be. scripts. Yeah, it felt like the old days, like I was reading the original scripts from the from the nineties, and uh, I could hardly wait to find out what was going to happen in the next one. Oh, that's awesome! Well, they've rated it like fourteen, like uh, for like fourteen and up. Like it got a higher rating than it. No, a normal Disney cartoon. Well, show because would. the people, like most of the people watching this, are not going to be kids, like like new kids. It's going to be people like us and probably like, you know, people, I would assume that the bulk of the audience is like going to be nostalgia driven. But well, the show always did deal with a lot of adult issues. It really did. But I guess like kids it are affected kids as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So the show did never, never set out to strictly be for kids. No. They wanted the it to be universally applicable to, to life. Yeah, mm -hmm. and this is the way they wrote it, and it was. And, and uh, like, I, I can't imagine it's not going to be successful. It's got to be. And it's, <laughs> and it's, it's even more pertinent today than it was twenty five years ago. Yeah, sad times. Sad times. I, I see. I the see. The world tons has of... deteriorated so much. Oh yeah. You know, and we can't get along. You know, when I was a hippie back in the sixties, we thought we were going to change the world. And I've said this before in other interviews, and I'm really disappointed that. Uh, it's gotten worse because I yeah. really thought yeah. that, you know, we found the answer, you know, that peace, love, and that was going to make things different. Oh, I still think it's the answer. I just think the, well, it, it is, but there's fewer people that believe in it. These I days. agree. I agree. Everyone, like, I feel like the world is made up of so many microcosms now. Like, it's not just, you don't, the need, the need to try to find common ground with somebody else that you may not agree with is, is getting harder. Like you don't need to anymore. You can just go find a weird community that agrees yeah. with you online, and then you're you can feel great about whatever backwards opinion you have because you don't and have the violence. Face. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
the violence that yeah. when I first came to Toronto in 74, uh, we didn't lock our doors. Mm -hmm. And I lived in Cabbage Town. And exactly, I, <laughs> I lived where the studio is that we record X Men in. Mm -hmm. huh. 49 Ontario Street was my address. And it was an old house that leaned, owned by a couple of Hungarians. And I rented it with a couple of other actor friends of mine. And we worked across the street for Young People's Theater. And then they tore it down. And uh, they built this studio called sounds interchange which before was behind our house it was a tiny little pillbox mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh they built this mega studio around it it's about i don't know five six stories high and uh i keep joking with the receptionist when i walk in that he, he's sitting in my old kitchen <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's where i live <laughs> the whole first year i came to canada wow so that was also a, a mind-blowing experience to go back and not only record X-Men in the same studio we did in 94 uh, through 7, but <laughs> that's my awesome. old house, you know? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I was sitting on the, on the front stoop, drinking a beer, watching them build the CN Tower. Wow, that's amazing. So we've heard that like a lot of you have been recording Season 2 already. Have you already done Season yeah, 2 as yeah. well? And so with the... Uh, you probably can't talk about this, but rumors have it that there's going to be three seasons or like the writer has written three seasons or whatever. We have. No but I, I, yeah, I just wonder if they've like had given you a cutoff or if maybe things are open for like if it's successful to keep spinning. Oh, out yeah, they, they've so, signed us to a, a fairly long option. Oh, oh that's awesome. excellent. That's that's definitely it's what I want to do. It means nothing, <laughs> all it means is that they have control over you for uh, a fair length of time well, as long as it's successful they, they can they can as long as it's successful yeah, they, it means they, we they, fans have control we can make it happen fans have control they, they can just keep renewing us as long as they want yeah well hey it's, i hope so here's to so, 10 you know, years and nobody's years. really arguing about that i mean no no the fact that at our age you know we can still work well it must be uh you know comforting to know that something you did you know that seemed like a, a not disposable, but something you'd done and then moved on to more stuff has such a lasting effect on, you know, a whole generation of people. Yeah. And it gets to and come back and still to do respect it again. It today. Yeah. And that uh, you can still do it. Yeah. And it's still like, I'll go into like a nerd arcade or a nerd bar somewhere and it'll be playing on the TV. Like it's, it's what people, they're, they're still, it's still there. It's still going. Yeah. Well, my grandson goes to school and he goes, my grandfather is the voice of beast on X-Men. <laughs> go, no, he's not. You liar! You know, <laughs> they, they don't believe me. That's the guy from Fraser. <laughs> you know it. You're like, do you have to like record a video of you doing it just to prove it? Or I feel you like know, that's I won't go to that. Line. Yeah. <laughs> no. All right, Dad, we should probably let uh, let George go. Do you have uh, a, I, nothing I, on TV tonight? So it's... oh, okay. Well, actually, I did. I did. I did have one question about, and I like um, about early career. Uh, can you can you explain what the sex and violence family hour was to me? Because <laughs> it, it's on YouTube, and, uh, and I, I skimmed it earlier tonight. I know Jim Carrey started on it too, so you worked with him. Earlier. Yeah, yeah, that was. Have yeah. I never heard of this? What is First this? shows. It's and, a very uh, interestingly jumble of sexual skits. Uh, well, it was written by the guys that did, wrote Laugh In. Right. Yes. Yep. Mm. That '60s uh, irreverent show that mm -hmm. you know mm. snuck past the censors. And uh, Playboy produced it. Oh, yeah. You can tell that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of tame compared to, you know, a lot of other things. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's, it's pretty tame TV. But it was, a, it was a heck of a lot of fun, you know. Again, you know, how can you not have fun with dancers? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And J Jim Carrey might like it, especially, I guess that was early because that came out in... Uh... What was that? It was 83 or something. 83, like yeah. So this is like way before he hit, really. Yeah. So must have been a, a hoot watching him kind of come into his own. Yes. We had a lot of fun doing that because a lot of it was improv. Mm. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 There right, was this, we made up a lot of our own sketches. Like that, the, the guy that did the flasher, uh, Chaz Lowther. 
Mm -hmm. He was the guy that would flash everybody and the, you know, the ladies would hold up the signs, you know. <laughs> well, we devised this little scene where I played Onan the Barbarian <laughs> and I'm, I'm there biting through this steel chain mm -hmm. and he comes and he flashes me. <laughs> and I drop the chain and I, I go, oh, look. And I grabbed it. He had a hot dog on a string. <laughs> and I grabbed the hot dog and took a big bite of it and walked off the sea. And he fell over. <laughs> that was awesome. a totally improvised skit. Oh, we made man. it up on the spot. So is comedy something you always wanted to get into? Well, as an actor, you have to be able to do everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that, uh, again, when I was an apprentice, uh, I don't want to be a name dropper, but my mentor was uh, Robert England. Oh, wow. Oh, really? Yeah. At the Great Lakes Shakespeare Festival. Yeah. He, uh, yeah, he had quite an extensive career in theater before yes. he did. You know. And but this was something that as a young actor, uh, they taught us that you have to have as many skills as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. Learn how to do everything. And uh, you don't lie about what you can't do. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that uh where, where was i going with this again oh just back, well, I, well I, that's I, interesting because i've heard other actors say you always lie about what you can't which do is stupid. and then just if you get the role just learn it that's you what know, i've heard actors sometimes say. you don't I, I had to give motorcycle riding lessons one time on a set because half the people had never been on a bike before and they oh, said you, they did. you hear so many stories sudden, about people that can't ride, horses. ride in a pack yeah and the guy that you're six inches away from has never ridden a bike before yeah, well yeah, that's scary <laughs> that could there's, cause a lot of problems there's so many stories from like uh sets where like people said they could ride horses when oh yeah well they there's wanted a, a job you, and stuff like that i like, never lied about that yeah god no and i've been through i hate right horses and i are not good <laughs> <laughs> the very first the the camels i did an episode of the camels yeah and it was late in the day, and I'd been waiting all day and sold the horse. Mm -hmm. And it knew that I was a little shaky. Oh, yeah. And I put they, my they one leg in the stirrup, and I'd get my other leg over, and the horse just went. Oh. And I went over. Oh. No, went thank back you. on the horse, did it again, the <laughs> horse again. Went whoop. Flicked his shoulder, over I went. Finally, I got on the damn horse, and we're shooting the scene. And all of a sudden, I'm supposed to go down this trail. And the horse decides, no, I'm not going down that trail. And even though I'm pulling the reins, the horse goes back in the barn. <laughs> <laughs> the, the owner says, well, it's the end of the day. And he knows he's done working, so he's going home. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and on Sinbad, we never had the same horse twice in a row. Oh, no. Uh, so it was all, you never knew what you were going to get. Is that I had for one a reason? Horse that... Again, we're galloping along and doing this thing, and all of a sudden the horse takes off and heads into the lake. <laughs> what the heck is this? And the owner comes swimming over. He goes, oh, he can't pass by water. He loves to go swimming. And I go, why is he on set? Why am I riding him? You know, and again, another new horse comes in, and I'm sitting on the, We're doing close-ups, so we're doing dialogue. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I dropped out of frame. And this is because the horse lays down on the ground with me on it and starts rolling around. Oh, geez. And again, the owner runs up. He says, oh, he didn't get his roll in the grass this morning before we came to set. So he's <laughs> taking it now with me on it. No, no more horses. Yeah. And this was because the producer had just watched this movie. Uh, the, gun, the, the one with the, they remade it with uh, Denzel Washington. Uh, Anyway, he thought, hey, we got to get horses in Sinbad. So all of a sudden, horses appeared on set. We're sailors. Oh, the Magnificent, <laughs> seven, the Magnificent Seven? Would that be the one? That's it. The yeah, Magnificent okay. Seven. Yeah, okay. Yeah. The producer, David Gerber, watched the Magnificent. He said, ah, we got to get horses. Horses. We got to get these guys riding horses. <laughs> so oh, God, no. Idea. Yeah. Jeez, thanks. Uh, well, you mentioned yeah. Robert England. Did you have a proclivity for like? I noticed you're in some fun '80s horror movies. In fact, I uh, I just watched the other day. Um, me and me and I, I have a group of friends that we catch this show that's on Shutter, which is like horror movie Netflix. Uh, Joe Bob Briggs uh, thing, and uh, it's like dinner in a movie from back in the day. They show the horror movie, and the guy interrupts with 
talking about it. But they showed the brain, which uh, I, I saw you in. So uh, it looked like a kind of a fun movie to work on. Well, it was. It, it, it had its moments. I mean... Uh, the design for the brain is really cool. It was. The guy yeah. that uh, actually did the brain worked on Alien. Oh, really? Yeah. Hmm. He was that's one awesome. of the builders on Alien. Wow, uh, that's a that's a hell of a that's a hell of a uh, you know thing to have in your resume. Yeah, probably. And, one and, of you know, we had a heck of a lot of fun. I mean, it was hard work, and it was very low budget. We didn't oh, make yes, any yeah. money. And the <laughs> final tell. day, <laughs> the story behind that one is <laughs> when you post a bond, you have a completion date, mm -hmm. and if you don't finish the film by the completion date. You forfeit the bond. Mm -hmm. Well, we were so far behind that our final day went into the second day. And until they yell rap, we're done. You're still in the previous day. Oh, so we kept shot going. Two days straight, nonstop, oh, to try and the finish bond. that film. Did you get it? Oh, yeah, we did it. Oh, but wow. nobody slept. Oh, wow. wow. It was it was a the day lasted nearly 40 hours. Wow. Oof. Yeah, it's uh, shooting. Because uh, David, Ga I was going to say David Gale, the, uh, the the crazy scientist in that. Yes, uh, mostly he's known a very for, nice guy. Yeah, he's very recognizable, mostly from Reanimator. If you're into genre horror yeah, films, love Reanimator. He's, uh, he's he's the guy that he's the head in the the head in the in the king in the the bedpan in Reanimator. Uh, yeah, he's okay. in this. Plays yeah. another creepy scientist character. Mm -hmm. Well, those '80s horror friend. movies seem so fun, just because it was. They're so much it seemed to be like so improvisational and like what they could do as far as like effects and everything it just seemed to be like everybody throwing shit at the wall to yeah. see what's you up. ever you ever listen to frank zappa mm -hmm. oh sure oh yeah uh live at the roxy and elsewhere the mm -hmm. uh movie called the uh, song called cheapens mm -hmm. where he sings about the uh the horror movie mm-hmm I ate a hot dog. Mm. It tasted real good. Yum, yum, yum. Need him up. Yum, yum, yum. Well, anyway, he's talking about this giant monster that comes in, and underneath you can see the feet of the crew as they're marching this monster in, and you can see the two-by-four at the bottom. And I thought he was talking about the brain, because you can't actually, in one of the scenes, <laughs> see the feet as the brain is coming in, Oh the really? Four underneath the. Uh... <laughs> it's so great now because when they filmed a lot of those movies, like they they didn't know we'd eventually have Blu-ray and high definition and 4K. No. So like I watched it was an old Roger Corman movie called Galaxy of Terror with Sid Hag and Robert England's in it, and uh, there's a scene where like Sid Hag's character gets his arm cut off, and later on like all the people that die come back as ghosts, and you can see very clearly Sid Hag's arm painted black behind his arm like this as he's <laughs> running forward because it's all high definition now as you can see it perfectly yeah. it's very funny you know so, <laughs> it's like you know they, they, didn't, they thought the they, mist. Well, yeah, they yeah. thought the VHS would cover it all right or, or wherever it was on you're just on TV but uh, yeah it's funny it was yeah, we just well there's a, uh, before the pandemic they had a comic uh, not a comic con but a horror con here in Toronto mm. that uh celebrated the the launch of the brain on blu-ray oh yeah i think scream uh, uh, shout factory put it or scream factory yeah. you have that blu-ray on ray actually i do not but it, I, have I, I may have to add it to my, my pile <laughs> i have a lot of them but i don't i haven't got that one yet it's one i always was kind of enamored with the just because of the cover because like i love the design of the creature so much it was but uh well, now that i've seen it i know it's kind of for what it is and it's fun to watch again i'll definitely probably pick it up well, this one thing I like to ask our superpowered guests, uh, which is, if you could have any superpower in real <laughs> life, what would it be? Hmm. Flight. Uh, yeah, for sure. Without a doubt. Makes yeah, the ability easy. to just get out of the car and fly away when I'm stuck in traffic. <laughs> yeah. or, you never have to be stuck in traffic. Ever. You never yeah. have to be stuck <laughs> anywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. And, you know, it just... There was and, a, a when point. I was a fan of and the kids uh, watching uh, Superman in the 1950s, I mean, I did go up onto the roof of my garage with a blanket around my neck and jump off. And I was really disappointed that I hit the ground. 
<laughs> Me too. I broke a wrist that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We were so into Superman, you know, and <laughs> I wanted to fly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's Later on, when I, as a teenager, I think being invisible was something that I, <laughs> I think I, 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 charm. I think, I think I'd take yeah. immortal, immortality. I think that's what I would, I would go for. Uh, only if life is good. Yeah, that's the key. Although, oh, what if it's immortality and it sucks? Yeah, I always think yeah. about that because somebody did something where it was like, like the the realistic part of if you could never die, like if you'd be immortal, like what would happen? It's like eventually you'd get stuck somewhere, like a building yeah. would collapse or something, and you'd be at the bottom, and you never, you know, they'll pave over yeah. it, and you will just be trapped underground for eternity. Or your life just becomes so bad that you... yeah, the world explodes, and you're just drifting through space for all time, like you know, yeah. It's, yeah, that's not good. The planet will explode eventually. I guess know. if the, I guess if there's a, an off switch <laughs> that you could hit at some point, then then that would probably be the best way to go. But, yeah, but you're not really given one of those. No, well, I guess we I guess we all do have one. We just don't know when it's going to give. Yeah, one. that's the best. What do you think? Date. Yeah, you did some radio theater, right? I think oh, it was tons. maybe Allison yeah. said she did a radio theater with you. I did a lot of radio drama. I did like, several series. Oh, awesome. Really? Well, that's... See, I love radio theater. We do some here, too. We just did an X-Men radio theater. Um, I kind of feel like podcast is bringing that back a little bit. Like, there's more, yeah, like, so audio-only kind of content out yeah. there. There is yeah. a resurgence of some radio drama. But the CBC yeah. has stopped doing it. This is where I did most of it. George Jonas did a series, uh, Scales of Justice. I did a lot of episodes of that. And uh, Eddie Greenspan was the consultant on the show. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. He was there at every record. Wow. Mm. And uh, then I did another one with Bill Howell about a cab driver who was going out with a police officer. and That ran several <laughs> years. And then the, the BBC came over and uh, did a uh, one about uh, the equal rights i can't remember the name of that one but that was a big production as well and then i did a production of macbeth on uh cbc radio as well yeah oh, there's stuff mm. uh, see that was that's the part i always liked the best in that play was the mcduff game yeah that was a good part yeah uh, and awesome. you're allowed to say that play over like radio, right? It's only in the theater. The oh, name. that's just yeah. uh, when I was at Stratford, I used to go into everybody's dressing room and go, that's the best. Some people whistle, take some whistle people and then hit them with a the mung bean. Yeah, hit them with a mung bean. Some people well, David Hemblin, who played Mag Magneto and I shared a dressing yeah. room. Oh, really? On, oh. Uh, in a play called Pushkin. Mm -hmm. And uh it was it voted the worst play of the year in Toronto. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, oh, wonderful! It was it was a, it was very painful to do. Yeah, and neither one of us were in the second act, uh -huh. and then we didn't have any lines in the third act. And it was all about Pushkin and the, the Russian poets and this big duel at the end. And all our action was in Act One, and David always disappeared in Act Two, and I never knew where he went. <laughs> and uh, I asked him one day, and he says, well, you, you must come with me. <laughs> so we threw our jeans over our tights, and he ran next door to the hayloft, which was a bar. Yeah. Uh, and as he walks in, the waitress was already, oh, hello, Mr. Hamblin, here's your drinks, you know, and like three or four scotches <laughs> would be lined up. Perfect. He had it figured out. And he yeah, had it figured out. And so by the time the third act came around, we were half looped and we go back and we didn't have any lines. We just had to kind of stand around while uh, Pushkin and whoever he was having a duel with <laughs> did it all out. That sounds like my kind of theater acting. And then in act one, uh, we used to pass a flask around. This was part of the action. Right. And we decided oh. that, well, <laughs> you know, we might as well put real booze in the flask. And I've done that The before, job yeah. of each actor to put his personal brand into the bottle, the, the flask. Mm -hmm. And all the blocking for that play went to hell because <laughs> <laughs> the whole the whole scene became called "Get the Flask." 
So as soon as yeah. it was your line, you went and got the flask and took a, yeah. a, a big hit. And so it was like yeah. Dundas and Young. You know, That's people awesome. crossing stage back and forth, getting the flask. That is awesome. I'd love <laughs> to do a that. Fun drinking game we could come the up. Drinking with game, there. yes, on I've, stage. I've um, I've always said this to friends of mine, and I feel like someday I'm going to do it. That I really want to do, like in a, a production called Drunken Shakespeare, where you train for like you do the auditions, everything, or the practices, everything, rehearsals to learn a Shakespeare play, like Hamlet or something. And then the night of the show, you come out and you have to be drunk. Like you come out on stage, well, they get you all the Bradford. Yeah, I'm just gonna work there, I guess. Yeah, just, and then, just and then you have to the instead. Every no team, you those, keep drinking. Every single one of those old actors, he'd open up the drawer of his dressing room table, and there'd be a bottle in there. And That's I worked with an actor who actually walked off the stage and fell into the orchestra pit during a blackout. Oh no! So hammered. Oh no! Broke wow. his leg. Oh my god! Oh, there's like there's an that... instrument or two. There's that sort of romanticized romanticism that comes with like these old actors and like writers and stuff that just like were like functioning alcoholics. Well, they lived on booze. Yeah, but they somehow managed to make and cigarettes, booze, geniuses. and cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. They somehow managed to be geniuses or, or perform genius or make works of art, but do it while and, hammered. It always well, more impressive. Look at Richard Burton, you know, and and Hemingway. You know, he's Hemingway. hammered. Everybody. It's like. Well, I, I once said to my wife, I said, uh, you know, Hemingway had it made. I said he lived on a beach in Cuba. He had a bunch of cats. He just drank it every day and then, you know, wrote amazing novels. And then my wife mm -hmm. just paused. My wife's like, you know, he shot himself, right? And I was like, <laughs> well, you know, good run up until then, you know, <laughs> like, so. I worked with his daughter. Oh, really? Muriel. Yeah, Muriel. Wow. On that uh, miniseries, America, where the Russians take over the U.S. With the K. With a K. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What was she like? She because she, she was she, a very nice lady. Everybody yeah. was nice on that show. Yeah. yeah. They had a, half of Hollywood was on that movie. Christopherson was the the lead. Right. Chris Christopherson. We became good buddies on that one. Oh, oh yeah, really? he's my mom's favorite. I, I saw him live with her once. He's well, like, I did another movie with him, uh, Sodbusters. Mm. Oh, I don't know that, that was one. that was all SCTV people that wrote that. Oh, that's and half awesome. the cast oh, of Barney really? Miller. <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny movie. Oh, I'm gonna have to look up America. Very tongue in cheek. What was it called again? Sodbusters. Sodbusters. Okay, we're gonna have to check that one out. I'll check that one that out because that's numb. a fun movie. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Jesus! Everybody's in that America show. Sam Neill, Chris yeah. Christopherson. Everyway. <laughs> yeah. No, she huh. seemed like a, a pretty cool person. Uh, Chris Christopherson has that line. He plays right before he plays the song. He goes, "This song I wrote for my kids and their mamas." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mamas, plural. Yeah, and their and their mamas. Yeah. Oh, it's well. Pretty funny. What do you think, Devin? Yeah. Well, yeah, I think we should probably get. I think Mr. Matt. Mr. Booz has been very, very uh, nice with his time, and uh, we really appreciate you coming on. Well, I, I always love talking about this stuff. Ah, oh, dude, oh, like yeah. it's fun to reminisce, and uh, this is how yeah. I regale all my my handlers at Comic Cons is all these stories. You know, fifty three years and rubbing shoulders with all the crazies in this business. Where, where where's the book, George? Where's the, where's well, your book? I thought about it, and everybody tells me to write the damn book. Yeah, but, you should. You know. Mm. This, there's a lot of bad stuff that go. You don't really want to bring out the stupid stuff that people did, you know. Uh, mm. Yeah, I get that. You get there's ways you to tell half that. stories to avoid well, it. Yeah, like, I'm still friends with a lot of these people, and you know, some of them I drove to jail. <laughs> <laughs> but some you picked up from jail, some and that's I picked nice. up from jail. Both. There's, an, there's an easy fix, George. When you put them in the book, you just call them Project X. No, no, there's there's a lot of stuff in in my past that I'm not overly proud of either. That uh, well, nothing I really mean, heavy, but you no, know, it's it's your embarrassing call. moments that you really don't want to bring to light. And, yeah, well, you know, mm -hmm. it was the sixties, you know, we were all crazy. <laughs> it was a golden <laughs> era. Our brains sure. out. And, 
Yeah. Get the flask, one of the lesser known Tennyson quotes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thanks, MZ. It was, uh, it's all thanks to, to George. Uh, yeah, it's awesome. I'm actually, I think the next thing I'm going to do, if I, I think I got the stamina, I'm going to go watch uh, Descending Angel. I'm very excited to watch that. I'm going to watch Sodbusters. <laughs> we all got a lot Sod of movies Busters to watch. Was more fun than Descending Angel. Oh, yeah. Descending ah, Angels. I got yeah. the right one. Well, I, I'm sure it probably is. <laughs> one's about a mass murderer and one's a comedy. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was also who did I was Eric. Uh, oh, Eric Roberts. Eric Roberts. Yeah, and Diane Lane. Like I said, it's a big Diane cast. Lane. Yeah, I had a big fight with uh, Eric Roberts in that movie. Oh, really? Who won? Well, I did. I was the wrestler. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> Richard Jenkins in that too. Who's another yeah. actor that's like a, a character actor that's in a ton of cool stuff. So uh mm. yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. Also, it looks like it, the, all those there's all those old HBO movies. There's so many cool ones that like you've only they, they're all buried under like wherever I guess HBO Max or whatever the thing is now to find them. But like there's one called Cast a Deadly Spell from like that time, which is I caught on TV somewhere at one point. It's got like Fred Ward in it, and uh um uh it's like a world a, a 50s noir detective story where magic is real so like there are like they're ogres and elves just in bars drinking and like but it's still a hard-boiled 50s detective narrative mm. and it's such a cool movie um, what's it called cast a deadly spell oh. it came out around the same time early 90s they made a sequel with uh, dennis hopper but it's kind of different than the first one like they there's not much in common with the two of them but that actor as david warner is the villain in it who is like a voice yeah, actor and a ton of stuff great. And a bunch of Star Trek shows too, and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's a super cool. And that's another one that most people hadn't heard of, but was like one of those around that same time period of those cool HBO movies. So, it's kind of a there's a lot of equality there that a lot of people missed if you weren't because they're not available, you know, unless you you find them somewhere in HBO. So, lots to yeah, see. It's hard to find things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, George. It's been no, a real pleasure talking. Cool. I had a lot of fun. Yeah, it's those been a, a real honor. Good. It really has. Uh, I just loved Maniac Mansion so yeah. much. <laughs> dead, dead, yeah. dead. That's that's amazing. Uh, oh god, go watch Maniac Mansion, Andre, since you're not as familiar with it. I will. I honestly, I didn't even know how I never knew this thing existed because I think it like was just, around, I was watching the like very TV first part. episode. Like he runs up to his room, George's character. And he's a giant, and his dad wants to get into the room, but of course he can't because he's just standing on the other <laughs> side, of the holding the door shut. It's, it's, it's so funny. It's just so I, funny. I, I've been doing a bit of a, a nostalgia dive on some of those shows from that time period. Like I've been watching Erie, Indiana, uh, which was the one that I watched. I only caught a little bit of when I was a kid around the same time. And uh, so it's time. It's time. Yep. I'll get. I'll add. It, I'll add it to the rotation. Somebody well, had a question about uh, the last chapter that I saw. Scrolling along. Oh, do you see one of those, Devin? Oh, there was a last here? chapter, something reference. Last I saw chapter. something show up earlier, but I'm sort of I caught it when it came across. Last oh, oh, yep, sure. yep, Murphy. You were in the Canadian miniseries, yeah. the last chapter. I was curious what your time working with Michael Ironside uh, was like. Mike Ironside and I have been best friends since 1975. Oh, really? Oh, wow. wow, that's awesome. Talk about another we were prolific the same agency uh, together. I just talked to him on the, he called me on my birthday. Oh, and his birthday is the day before mine. And I forgot, oh, wow. him. but uh, no, we've been friends for a very long time. So working with him was uh, a joy. Uh, we've done a couple of things together. Is that where you met? We met at the agency, huh? oh. 1975. We were at the talent group, and uh, I was just uh, getting married. To my first wife, who was an actress, this you know lasted about as long as you spend in a, a hopscotch square. But uh, <laughs> I was—I just bought a, a whole set of pots and pans that I was taking home, and that's where Ironside and I met. It was at the agency where I was carrying all these pots and pans, <laughs> getting married. <laughs> and we've been he buddies ever domestic. since. Well, between yeah, you and him, I feel like I feel like if between if you combine your two careers, you've probably been in every single Canadian TV show. Well, movie. we did another movie yeah. together, a biker movie. Uh, uh, not uh, what was it called? Uh, oh, Easy Rider. No, no, no. no. <laughs> it was a comedy. Yeah. 
you know, say there are other biker movies there, Devin. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can't remember the, the name of it now. Oh, uh, yeah. I can look it up. What was uh, what was it kind of about? It was about this writer who's, uh, as he's writing, everything comes to life. Oh. I feel like I know this. And he was writing this novel about bikers, and all of a sudden he's surrounded by the real bikers because they all come to life. This seems really familiar to me. There was a the, recent movie done that was like that. Or yeah, I forget what it was called now. Was that a was uh, that a movie that you, the the that that film? The, the, this, the, this was a feature, yeah. Yeah, okay. Let's see. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, it's all good. Yeah, awesome. I know. I I, I can find what it was because there's got to be an old resume in here. I was gonna say, do you keep <laughs> extensive notes about like uh, your time on different shows and sets and stuff like that? No, but it's on my resume, which is uh, right beside me in my briefcase. If I can find it, there it is. Uh... Destiny to order. Ah, Destiny okay. To order. Destiny to order. That's Richard hmm. was, Stephen Womet was in it. Oh, from cool. the classic actor. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess we could cap it off by talking about that Christmas horror story. It's one of your more recent uh, recent films. Um, Thanks for saving Christmas. Yeah, when you play Santa Claus and get an extensive <laughs> fight with Krampus. Uh, which is pretty great. That must have been a blast to work on as well. I mean, well, it was a blast until that final scene. <laughs> yeah, you know, the big... that uh, the big fight in the uh, the stables. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. I felt so bad for that poor guy playing Krampus because all he wore was body paint, <laughs> and it was twenty five oh. below zero when we oh, shot. Oh no, no. Oh, it yeah. was hypothermic. Yeah. I mean, I was wearing all my Santa gear, you know, woolen cape and everything else, and long johns. This guy's wearing a loincloth and body paint. <laughs> yeah. and he looked he was, looked great. He, he looked great. It was freezing. Well, he had zero body fat. He was a professional yeah. bodybuilder. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, so I he think was the freezing his balls off there. It was where was that filming? It was in north of Toronto. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's just one of those I'm small towns high. that had a, a stable. Yeah, yeah. There's an extensive, uh, extensive scenes with uh, with George getting in fights with elves that are like yes. turning into zombies. <laughs> uh, there are elf the art flying everywhere. <laughs> yeah, they're just heads, like, yeah. and he's just kicking them, and they're flying across the room and going through walls. <laughs> it's, <Heads>. uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I can't remember what the name of the elf was, but there's a scene where, like, you know, the, like your friend elf has you, he's become the zombie, and you look down at him, you're like. Winky, <laughs> he's like, <laughs> you have to put him out of his misery, but it's just so funny because they're all like they have these ridiculous self names, and uh, uh <laughs> that was fun, yeah. And it, like, quite a bit, quite extensive, uh, like, like the, the fight sequences, right? Oh, yeah, sure. yeah, there was, yeah, a lot and of that, after action in that one, you know. So and even, it's funny, uh, the New York Times even reviewed that movie, and they said, really. And the old guy playing Santa was actually quite spry for his age. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, that was nice of them to say. Yeah. 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 Oh, you were for yeah. sure. Uh, there's several scenes here. Like, that's definitely not a stuntman. That's George. So, uh, uh, no, it's a, it's a fun movie. Like I said, the end is what wraps that thing up perfectly. When you when you get to that uh, and you realize all that, it's just very well done. So I don't want to say any more because I want the people to enjoy it when they get to watch it. But. Don't don't sleep on it. If you come across it, it's available oh, yeah. in crime. Uh, and the nice like, thing is that that was three different writers and three different directors really? <laughs> that were doing short stories that all mm -hmm. wove together into one plot. It flows fairly well. Yes. Yeah. And there were three distinct stories. Yeah. Yours is kind of the three, wraparound. Three one. different writers and three different directors. Yeah. I like so, those anthologies. Yeah. I'm a sucker for a good Christmas horror movie because I love Christmas. I love horror movies. So. Every once in a while, you know, it's fun to, yeah. fun to combine. That was the probably two. the most fun movie that I did as a Santa Claus. I did a <laughs> bunch of them for the Hallmarks and uh, oh, uh, really? Yeah, those must be. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think they do like what 80 of them a year. I think oh, last year they did 75 of them or something. So that was the last movie I did. Uh, that was two years ago. Oh, really? Uh, it was for the Great American Channel. There was a uh, the breakaway from Hallmark. 
and uh, uh, it's the same uh, stories basically you know the city girl inherits a farm in the middle of nowhere <laughs> a, big, yeah. a big festival and she goes home and falls in love with the caretaker and yeah, <laughs> who, who may or may not be Santa Claus? Uh, you know? no, no, I was just the guy that played Santa in the town that was trying to save the festival. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I imagine like uh, with an actor with a body burke like yours, uh, it eventually comes to a point where there are some jobs that are are jobs and some jobs that are fun. You know, yeah. And uh, so uh, that was the last one. I wasn't really into doing movies much anymore. I kind of. Decided I was going to hang up the live action stuff. Mm -hmm. the, another, the, the one Hallmark movie I did that was really fun was a, a Case for Christmas, where they sue Santa Claus because they didn't get what they wanted for Christmas. <laughs> the, <laughs> That's pretty funny. The Dean Kane great. was in that. He he played oh. the uh, the young guy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen it right here. Ninety what was it ninety two thousand eleven. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was a fun movie. Oh yeah, that looks. Yeah, I love your Santa Claus outfit. It's fantastic. Yeah, I still got it. I could camp out in it now. I think I weighed about three hundred and sixty pounds. When I did that. <laughs> oh geez. Uh, yeah. Before we before we go, Davin, that's a good question. I ended on. Do you have a favorite Santa Claus, Davin? Who's your favorite? Like your favorite depiction of Santa Claus in the film? And you can't say George because he's right there. But but George beats up Krampus. How is it not George? Um, that's fair favorite santa claus in a movie so um, mine is it's called sure, billy bob thornton in bad santa he's not really santa <laughs> but my, mine is the original uh, guy that uh miracle on 46 yeah, yeah he's he's great he is there, great. there's what a movie name, uh, sim something sim. Al, oh uh well alistair sim was the original scrooge Let's oh the dude, scrooge it? right right yeah um I can look it up, but there's a there's a movie as a Canadian made movie with Harry Dean Stanton in it called One Magic Christmas. It came out like in '85. Mary Steenberger's in it, and the guy that plays Santa, and I think he's a Canadian actor, but he is seem seemingly the most. He's very Nordic too, like he's you know, and he's he seems like the most Santa. To that me. Jefferson Mappin. Oh, oh man, I gotta find it because I put myself on the spot here. Uh. I'll look it up here one sec. Who played Santa? Well, while you're looking that up, I'll say one thing. If this, we do get quite a few seasons of this X Men revival, which I hope we do, and they kind of channel where your character has been going in the comics recently, there's some crazy stuff to come. Yeah, uh, I hear uh, Beast really took a turn for the worse in the comic books. Yeah, now they're going to go back in time and bring back a Beast everybody likes. So <laughs> that's good. Gonna... Is which, that what they're doing in the bush right now? Which, which, yeah, yeah which looked exactly like your character. I know yeah, he turned oh, yeah. to a villain, but I didn't know they'd gone full full circle. Uh, Jan, yeah, yeah. Jan Jan Rubis is the guy playing Jan Santa Rubish. Anyway. Yeah, Jan Rubish. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he was the married to Susan Rubish, who brought me to Canada. Oh, really? Wow, what's yeah, really? world? Yeah, that's her husband. He was an opera singer, and then he became an actor. He's a he seems like the most like he just seems like a magical old world spirit in it. He, he does a very yeah, good job. I mean, he's he's not a fat Santa, he was a very thin well, they had a lot of stuff on him, he was, yeah. you know. <laughs> but uh, you know, that's cool, awesome. Well, that's a small world. There you go, bring it back yeah. around to Santa. It always comes back to Santa. Well, yeah. anyway, we should let you go, George. Thank you so much for being in the show. It's well, thanks for having me, it's been a lot of fun. And if we ever make it, uh, let's make it to a con sometime. You guys are doing your yeah, thing. That'd be great. Or if we yeah, do we... something down east. Yeah, yeah. We, get, we get, want to get you guys all to Halifax here. We hey, you we could host a big panel with you all. It'd be fantastic. Yeah. It, it probably we'll would do well. A, a Santa movie down in Halifax. Oh yeah, I'll be they going film... for Christmas or something like one of these. Uh, oh yeah, there was a biker yeah. Santa that picked up the the lead actress who was trying to make it home in time for her Christmas wedding. Right, huh. they, they were. They didn't film a few of those down here. There, there's, there's actually quite a bit going on in in Halifax for filming. Yeah, so uh, it's a show, a horror movie or horror show called From that they film here. That's been uh, going on for a while. So that's that's a big one. And was it that other one that everyone loves, Sullivan's Crossing? It's oh like yeah, Taylor Park yeah. Boys. Yeah, that's that's still going. <laughs> they got a new. Thing. Yeah, I see. They has a new show. Uh, big... The Trades, I think yeah. it's called. Yeah, Rob Wells has it. Mm. The uh, Ricky's yeah. character. Yeah, Rob is hilarious. Yeah, yeah, it's good yeah. stuff. 
It's nice. Mm-hmm. It, it certainly put Halifax on the map, or at least Nova Scotia. For, I mean, they yeah, always Paul filmed. Selleck used to do his movies there too. Yeah, those Jesse Stone ones. Yeah, the Jesse Stone. They have the big sign up down at Whiskey's Bar on Portland Street. There, it's just like because that's where they turned his office in like oh, really? that bar into his office. Yeah. Well, they film so like almost every Stephen King adaptation comes here. So uh, there's lots of those. Yeah, you know, it does look cheap. like Maine. And it's cheaper to film here than it is there. I shot a miniseries up in Fort Louisburg. Oh, really? Oh, really? Frontier, yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, that... Not that Netflix show, Frontier. No, that was way before that. Oh, this is back in 84, 85. That that Netflix show was filmed in Newfoundland with um, Jason Uh, Momoa. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a friend of mine worked on the special effects. This was the Battle of Fort Louisburg. We reenacted the uh, oh, the siege of Fort Louisburg. That's awesome. A very big part of our history over here. Had the perfect set for it. Yeah, Yeah. Fort Louisburg. Imagine that. Yeah, Yeah. amazing. Awesome. Interesting. Well, yeah. Thanks a lot again, George. Yes, Uh, thanks, George. I know that the the ex goons are going to enjoy this. Well, Um, I hope so. Oh, and then yeah. we'll see them all uh, in a week down at uh, the ex- exhibition center, their convention center. Oh, Actually, Fan Expo. Yeah. Fan Expo. We're doing one day on Fan Expo. And then on the Saturday, Disney is holding a screening of the first two episodes at the uh, con. Uh, what oh, day really? will that be? Will that be before the release? On Saturday, the 16th. Oh, wow. So, oh, early access. Yes. That's awesome. Oh, that's awesome. Well, that's they're so holding cool. one in, on the 13th in L.A. Yeah, you're saying. That's uh, oh. cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow. So they're sweet. holding one in Toronto on the uh, 16th. Well, before yeah, but, it actually hits. I, the barely they day. didn't know it was my birthday, or else there would probably be one here in Halifax. <laughs> yes, it, of it, course. It, 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 yeah. Of course. But, you know, it is a national holiday pretty much, Devin. So, we, you know, we have to. We have to make oh, sure that we best <laughs> birthday present ever. The X Men's back for two episodes. It is true, honestly, yeah. George. I can't think of anyone that I know that would 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 enjoy that more than David. So, <laughs> well, happy that's birthday. birthday! Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, I, I promise not to cry too much. No, uh, <laughs> yeah, stay dignified. Yeah. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly. Experiment drone. Yeah, Tennyson. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. Right, thank, well, thank you, yeah. George. All righty. Have a great evening. Have a good night. You too. Catch you next time, everybody. Next time. Mm-hmm.